Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for the Tech Guy is provided by Cashfly. C A C H E F L Y dot com. Hi, this is Leo Laporte, and this is my Tech Guy podcast. This show originally aired on the Premier Radio Networks. It's about 180 stations nationwide now. And XM Satellite 166 on Saturday, September 8, 2012. This is episode 907. Enjoy. The Tech Guy podcast is brought to you by Ring Central. I love my cloud based phone system from Ring Central. Zero startup costs, and Ring Central is just $20 per month per user. Try it now with a 30 day risk free trial. You buy one desk phone, they'll get a second phone to you for free up to 20 phones. Call 800 543 9980 or visit ringcentral.com and use our promo code TWIT. And by Gazelle, the fast and simple way to sell your iPhone, iPad, MacBook, or Android smartphone. Find out what your gadget is worth and get cash to upgrade to the new iPhone at gazelle.com. Well, a good day to you, my friends. Leo Laporte here, the tech guy. And it's time to talk about computers and the internet and home theater, cameras, cell phones, and Kindles. 8888-ASK-LEO is my number. 888-827-5536. That's toll-free from anywhere in the U.S. Lots of listeners overseas thanks to the Internet. You can always call me there uh, from uh, anywhere in the U.S. or the world by using Skype out to that number. And it'll be uh, toll-free. 8888-ASK-LEO. 888-827-5536. Well, let me think here. Uh... I guess I should talk about uh, Amazon's big announcements. Very interesting, I thought. Um, uh, yes, day before yesterday, September 6th, Amazon had a big event and announced five new Kindles, which is their best-selling product. Jeff Bezos, the CEO of Amazon, said that right from the start. He said, this is our best-selling uh, product. The Kindle Fire, the best-selling tablet. I think it might even be the best-selling uh, Amazon product overall, a Kindle Fire. So, uh, But they still make those e-ink uh, readers, you know, the little thin ones with the two weeks of battery life, and, uh, you know, it doesn't, it's not graphical. It, uh, it's, uh, in fact, it's kind of like an Etch-a-Sketch technology. They use charged particles on the screen, so it doesn't use any power when you're reading it, only when you turn the page. And they're making a new one of that called the Paper White. Which is awfully close to the paperweight, but I don't. Th I think what they're. <laughs> I don't think they're trying to. I think they're trying to explain the fact that the the contrast is better. You know, the original e ink. That's the technology they use. The e ink Kindles were crisp, but it was it was it was black text on kind of a gray green screen, so it wasn't like reading a book. And they claim this new one. We won't know till it comes out. Uh, I think it's October first. Uh, they claim this new one uh, is more, well, I presume with the name, it's paper white, right? It's a little more black text on white. We'll see. I don't think that was the most important announcement. They did drop the uh, price of the uh, lowest cost e-ink Kindle, I think, to $59. So that's that's pretty amazing. There, You know, what Amazon's doing at this point, and even Jeff Bezos said this, he said, we don't want to make money on the product. We want to make money on the stuff you buy with the product. So he's able to do something that really most computer manufacturers can't do. He's able to price these lower than cost or at cost. I think in some cases lower than cost. Just like, you know, who does else who does that game uh, machine manufacturers, the Xbox, for a long time uh, cost less than it uh, costs to make. And, and certainly... Uh, it's taken a long time for Microsoft to recoup even the R&D, the hundred, almost a billion dollars in R&D, I think, on that Xbox 360. So, but they, but they make it up in the games because they make money on every single game sold from it, even if it's not a Microsoft game. And Amazon really isn't in the hardware business, are they? Amazon 
is in the content business. And I think that's the, the most interesting thing about the announcement. I'll, I'll talk some more about that as soon as I give you the, the lowdown on the products. So they, uh, they have the paper white. And then uh, they have uh, they have a new uh, several new Kindle Fires. So the Fire is their tablet. There was a big deal when the Fire came out because they were selling it for two hundred bucks for an eight gigabyte tablet. Now two hundred dollars for an eight gigabyte tablet, same size, seven inches, but with sixteen gigs of storage for two hundred bucks. You can get thirty two gigs for uh, two fifty, and much, I guess two ninety nine. I'm sorry, for a hundred bucks more, you get uh, double the storage, and much faster processors and much higher resolution screen. And I think that's the thing that's very interesting about this. These are really beautiful uh, screens that are, well, you might as well call them Retina. They're within a few dots per inch of Apple's Retina display iPad. So they're very competitive. And they have some advantages over the iPad. Dual speakers, for instance. Dolby Stereo. So better, much better sound. The sound on the iPad, the new iPad's not great. The 7-inch tablet has a 1280 by 800 display. <laughs> and then, and that's available uh, for order now. All of them are available for order now. That'll be shipped on September 14th. And then there's an 8.9-inch for 299 Hundred bucks more, and then three sixty nine for the thirty two gig, and this has a nineteen. This is kind of almost hard to believe. Nineteen hundred by nineteen twenty by twelve hundred HD display. That is very high quality. Dual core one point five gigahertz processor with uh, high end three D graphics. It's got uh, dual band. Both of them have dual band Wi Fi, both 2.4 gigahertz and 5 gigahertz. So that could make a big difference on the cra- because Wi Fi is getting crowded. There's these very nice screens. Uh, they're not, they're using Android, but they never mention that because it's a highly customized Android. That's kind of one of the big question marks on these. Uh, it, until I get a hold of one, of course, I ordered them and I will have, by this time next week, I'll have uh, the 7 inch version. Um, the software was kind of, uh, the operating system was kind of mediocre on the last Kindle Fire. We'll see if it's better on this one. It needs to be because it's competing now with a much broader spectrum of devices. There's Google's Nexus 7. That's that's made by uh, Asus in a very nice $200 tablet. And Apple, of course, has the iPad. It's more than twice as much, but I, they're going to announce mini iPads, we think, next month. Maybe they'll be in the same price range. So this is a competitive market. But here's where Amazon has a huge advantage. And it's really uh, a way that the industry has changed dramatically. In the early days of the technology industry, it was it was all about, I'll say from, uh, say, 1990 on, not the earliest, earliest days, but by the time the IBM PCs and compatibles were pretty widespread, it was all about inexpensive hardware, expensive software made by Microsoft and others, then Apple kind of set that on its head by making more expensive hardware. They made their money on the hardware. And then with the iPhone and the iPad, they got software prices down to a buck, three bucks, five bucks. So they flipped it and, by the way, became more profitable than Microsoft in the process. So that was a big change. But there's another change already on the heels of that change. <laughs> and I think this is the big one. It ain't about the hardware at all. It's about the content. It's about the services and that's why, even though Jeff Bezos did talk about specs, as I just did with these new Kindle Fires, what they're really, their real advantage is they can get the price so low that you don't even have to, you know, you don't have to really think about it. It's not a $1,000 device. It's not a $500 device. It's a $200 device. I mean, you have to think about it, but it's a lot, lot less. And they make it up in content. The companies that can do that, what it, what it says is that anybody can design hardware now. And it's true, you know. These chips are widely available. These screens are widely available. It's kind of known how you put them together. The operating system, thanks to Google, is free, Android. So you don't have to put a lot of money into R&D. You just build the hardware. And where you make the money is on content and services. And this is where Amazon has an advantage over everybody else. They're a store. This is a huge advantage. Now we kind of understand why Apple has been working so hard to create 
the iTunes and the music and the movies and the TV shows and why they've been just the last few months going to the cable companies and the content creators like HBO and saying, please, let's do a deal. They realize that the world is changing again. It's not about hardware anymore. It's not even about programs, applications as much as it is about content and services. And that's what Amazon's pushing. And Amazon makes a cut over every movie they sell, every TV show they sell, every song they sell. Every application they sell, they have their own app store. It all goes through Amazon. They make the money. And Apple's looking at that. You know who else is looking at that? Google. Guess what Google did in the last few months? They started really emphasizing the Play Store, didn't they? And Microsoft in the last few months with the Xbox Media Center. All of a sudden, you see what's going on. It's about content. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Ah, you're right, and uh, that's the other advantage with the updated uh, 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 Audible store. Hey, I'm a tech guy. I know it, and you do too. And it, but that's just you know, I mean, not Audible's a, a small fraction of the users, but that's interesting, isn't it? They make you go through the Audible store now, the Audible app now. Let me see if I got my Audible update. I got it on my other. This is the look. By the way, look at this nice case somebody sent me. It's bamboo. That's for the Nexus 7. Isn't that nice? It pulls apart like that. But it's a nice Nexus 7 case. It really makes the Nexus 7 look kind of classy. Did I get it? I haven't got an Audible update on the tablets, I guess. Oh, yeah, I did. There you go. Audible for Android was updated. Mm-hmm. Let's update these. Sometimes uh, Android normally is automatic updates, but uh, that you get manual updates when the when the terms change. So apparently Facebook has changed its terms. So it says new approximate network based precise GPS location. Yeah, 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 I don't care. Does anybody ever read those? Netflix, what's new in there? Let's see. Whoops. Nope. Update. Let's see what's new here. Uh, allow Wi-Fi multicast reception. That's kind of interesting. I don't know what that is. That's something new in Netflix. Network communication will pair with Bluetooth devices. Netflix over Bluetooth. And then Spotify has some new hardware. Change your audio settings. Control near... Oh, NFC and Spotify. That's interesting. So you look at those, you got some interesting things about what Spotify might be up to. Maybe you tap your phone against something and it plays the song. Uh, yeah, this must be a new version of Audible because it's re-registering. It's reloading my library. Yeah, I love this. So now Audible will whisper sync. Share your playlist via NFC. That's cool. Thank you, buddy. So what do I have on here? Night Soldiers and the Magic of Reality. So now... Is it? It's not whisper sync. Oh, but I have, probably have to launch it. Where am I listening to this? Oh, it's on my iPhone. I'm probably not listening in the app. Yeah, iOS is really a little behind, aren't they? So this is Flipboard, which is great. I think a seven inch is the right size. I can't wait to get the uh, the new Kindle seven inch. I ordered both the 7 and 8 and 9. I, the 7 because I had to get it as soon as possible. The 8 and 9 because I'm interested in that size. But I think 7 inches is going to be good. Well, I burn through gadgets because it's my job. I'm not, I'm not a normal... You understand I'm not a, just a normal user. <laughs> you, wouldn't, you wouldn't want a tech guy who said, Well, you know, I just haven't tried Windows XP, but... Uh, I'm sure it's good. Sometimes it's a pain. You know, you get attached to something and you got to move on because, you know, for instance, I'll tell you what's good, where the pain point's going to be. When the iPhone 5 comes out next week, I've got to order it and I've got to use it. And I, I don't want to give up my Galaxy S3. I know that's going to be a pain.
Uh, this is the, uh, I buy the low end uh, usually on these things. So I got the 8 gig of this and I got the 16 gig of the Fire. Because, uh, you know, you want to see, well, how does, and same thing with the Retina. How does the base unit perform? And if it's slow, then you, then you can make the recommendation. Oh, you should upgrade to a uh, higher. Inspector Gadget, that's me. Go, go, Gadget. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Somebody in the in the chat room. We have a great chat room, by the way. You can get there by going to our website, techguylabs.com. Thank you, John. A cup of coffee. That'll help. That'll come in handy. Go to the website, techguylabs.com, and you'll see a link to our chat room there. And it's a great way to participate kind of behind the scenes on the show. And, uh, you know, I converse with the chat room after, uh, during the breaks and stuff. I can't do it so much when I'm on the air, but during the breaks. And somebody in that chat room was commenting, God, Leo goes through gadgets like crazy. Because, <laughs> yeah, I'm holding now the Nexus 7, but, of course, uh, next week you'll see me holding the Kindle Fire instead. And I said, that's my, you know, I'm not a normal user. That's my job. I am Inspector Gadget. My job is to try all this stuff so I can give you some sense of how it works, whether it's worth buying. People ask me all the time, Android or iPhone, for instance. And I have to say, it's not always a blessing. It's fun. It's the reason I got into this business primarily. I remember very well. I was, it was 1978. <laughs> And uh, as a young man, and I was, uh, you know, I, I remember seeing, this was probably a little later, maybe 1982, 83, seeing the uh, Apple Lisa. And just, I was, <laughs> it's like the, the kid with his nose pressed against the candy store window. I had my nose pressed against the Apple store window, looking at this Lisa, wanting it. And it was $10,000. And I, I can't afford that. I could never, I was a poor DJ just out of college. I can't afford that. But I wanted it. So I started writing for computer magazines. Back then it was Byte and InfoWorld and some defunct magazines like the Atari magazine. Yeah. And uh, and that was one way to get, you know, software anyway. And at some point I said to myself, you know, if I could pursue this as a, you know, as a, as a business, if I become a tech guy, maybe on the radio, maybe on TV, I don't know. But if I become, you know, that maybe... I, won't, I can always have the latest stuff. Boy, I cursed myself that day. <laughs> I became the tech guy. Yes, been doing this for more than 20 years now. Uh, and it's true. I have access to whenever anything comes out, I order it. Because that's my job. But it's kind of a curse. I was telling the people in the chat room during the break, yeah, I'm kind of attached to my Samsung Galaxy S3. I think this is the best phone out there right now. But you know what? Next week, I'm going to have to order an iPhone, the new iPhone when it comes out. Because I have to use it, and I'll I'll I'll, re I'll probably have to retire this beautiful phone that I love so very much, and use the iPhone five for a while. And a lot of you are going, yeah, oh, play me a violin, Leo. <laughs> but you get, you know, your life. I would sometimes you want to be like a normal person and use a phone for a little while, not for two years. No, I'm not that crazy, but for for a few months anyway. But it really is. A, it's kind of fun to get to try all the new stuff. And then somebody else in the chat room said, well, well why don't you just get loners? Why, do you, uh, why are you buying this stuff? And, uh, of course, in the early days when I was a young uh, journalist just starting out writing those articles, I did, in fact. You know, they would send you software or hardware for a loaner, and you'd send it back. And I did that a lot because you can't afford to buy all this stuff. But I'm in a good, I'm fort very fortunate position now. I actually have a budget every month, several thousand dollars to buy this stuff. And I'll tell you why I prefer to buy it. You get it on a loan. First of all, I don't think I uh, have enough prestige with Apple to get a loaner. I'm not daring fireball blogger John Gruber. I'm not New York Times writer David Pogue. I'm not Walt Mossberg of the Wall Street Journal. I'm just the little old me. So Apple, frankly, Apple doesn't really doesn't like me very much because, you know, I don't always say I like Apple stuff, unfortunately. <laughs> Sometimes I say I don't like it. They don't like that. So... I doubt I could get an iPhone 5 anyway. But let's say I could. The problem is then the next day they say, well, how do you like it? The day after they say, well, we'd like a product manager to come up and show you all the nice features. The third day they say, where's the review? The fourth day they say, where's the review? The fifth day they say, where's the review? The sixth day they said, Why, how dare you not like this phone? 
I do. <laughs> it's not. Let me tell you, the free loan. And then the sixth day, they say, we want it back. So you, you get a week with it. You get maybe two weeks with it and you send it back. It ain't worth it. So unfortunately, or fortunately, uh, I end up buying most of this stuff. Occasionally, we have a product review show, and we go through so much stuff on that, five or five products a week, something like that, that we do take loaners. I have a, a Dell uh, XPS uh, all-in-one computer over here. And, and frankly, I'm glad to get it as a loaner, because if I had to buy, I wouldn't want to buy, to probably to buy that. I don't have any need for that. But phones, I don't mind buying. They're less expensive. Tell you another reason Apple doesn't lend me anything. <laughs> so Apple's having its big event, its announcement, its launch on Wednesday the 12th. No, by the way, that's all we know. But we do, on the invitation, it had a big 12 for the date. And then the shadow of the 12 was a big 5. So I think it's safe to assume the iPhone 5, whether it'll be named that, I don't know. But the iPhone 5 will be the the topic of this launch event. There are some, you know, uh, 9 to 5 Mac is sure that they're also going to announce iPods that on Wednesday. I don't think so, but that's that's what they're saying. And uh, they invite Tame Press to those events. I am not, of course, on that list. Used to be, but I'm not anymore because I'm not tame. And uh, And then they don't stream it either, you know, which is weird because what happens is the press that gets invited to those events now uh, sits there with their laptops, and they and they what they do is they call the live blogging. They type, 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 type. Everything that Tim Cook, Phil Schiller, and Scott Forstall, the Apple executives, say as they say it, and they take pictures. And they so I don't understand why Apple just doesn't stream this thing. They're in effect losing control of the of the of of it by not streaming, but they don't. So, and then, uh, by the way, remember Steve Jobs had to tell them all to turn off their Wi-Fi because it was breaking the demonstration. He was mad. Turn off your Wi-Fi. <laughs> I, I, so it's beyond me why Apple doesn't do this. But remember, they're a control freak company. They really are. They're, they're the most control freak company. And most tech companies are. They're worse than anybody. So uh, the way we cover these events, and we will, we'll, we'll do our own live stream in which we, you know, at twit.tv, my podcast network, will be in here. All my commentators and experts will be in here. We'll have a Google Hangout as well and all that. And we'll commentate as it's going on by reading the live blogs. But I really feel like I wish, gosh, I wish we could stream it. So this time, and this is Apple's going to hate me, we're going to do a reenactment of the uh, keynote because I can't stream the keynote. I tried that. They didn't like that so much, so I can't stream the keynote. So we're gonna we've got a puppet, Brian Hogg, who's a really great puppet maker up in uh, in Toronto area, has made me a Tim Cook puppet, and we're gonna have a, <laughs> a little puppet stage, <laughs> a little puppet screen. We'll put the slides up as they show them. Tim, uh, puppet Tim will read the. Uh, <laughs> So we'll just do a little reenactment. So if you can't watch the live stream, and and you can't because the Apple's not doing it, and if you weren't part of the tame press that Apple invites to these things, you know, people who are going to say nice things, uh, you could join us for the live puppet reenactment. You'll get the same content. <laughs> I can't wait. 8888 ask Leo. Oh, am I out of time? Shocks. Uh, shocking. Uh, well, um, I'll tell you what. We'll take a break and we'll go to the phones. 888-827-5536. Jim and Fremont's next. Setting up an anonymous blog. We'll tell you how. Stay here. Actually, Brian Hogg is going to do the voice of Tim Cook. So what, what's going to happen? is that Brian is going to have a, um, uh, he's going to be on uh, Skype via uh, via Skype from uh, Toronto. He's going to have a green screen, and then we're going to superimpose behind him on the green screen a stage and the, and the pictures and stuff. And he'll be a little Tim Cook. You know, he didn't have time. Next time we'll have a little Phil Schiller and a little Scott Forstall. He didn't have time for that. So uh, unlike the real event, Tim Cook will deliver the whole thing on our event. And then next time, we're going to have Wald Statler and Waldorf, a.k.a. Oh, thank you. Frazier. Frazier, Frazier, you're trying to kill me. The world's largest Rice Krispie treat. 
I could, you know what? I could just frame that. It's a, it's portrait sized. The world's largest. Isn't that funny? Thank you, Fraser. What's not supposed to be on? He took last week off. Uh, I've talked already to, I didn't sell, email Trevor, but uh, Kyle has to uh, be ready to do that. But we will. It doesn't, it takes us about, to do an entire, bank an entire show show takes about four shows. So we got plenty of time. Um, but, uh, yes. So no, I don't think we'll, Kyle, you don't want to bank calls today, do you? Uh, I'm, I'm cool with doing it whenever you want to. Let's, let's start, plan on starting doing that next week, okay? Perfect. On Saturdays or both days? Uh, Saturdays. Okay, sounds great. Hey, this show brought to you today by our friends at Ring Central. Wider than a mo- no, RingCentral.com. They are our cloud-based phone system, which we are very we use. This is my Ring Central phone. So this is, uh, you know, it's a standard Polycom business phone. Plug it in the wall just like you would a regular phone, but <laughs> I don't even, is it Ethernet? I don't know how you plug it. I think you just plug it. I don't know. You just plug it in the wall, and it's all configured. It works. RingCentral.com. It is a great way to eliminate the PBX in the basement and actually get more features from a business phone system because they're all in the cloud. Zero startup costs. $20 a month per user, the average cost. That's what we pay. And then, right now, for uh, listeners to our podcast, you buy one phone and you get the second phone free up to 20 phones. So you get, you're get you going to get a good deal on the phones, too. A 30-day risk-free trial awaits you at 800 800- Five four three ninety nine eighty, or you can visit ringcentral.com and use twit as the promo code. I, you know, we really kind of agon- I agonize. I, I think I've talked about this about what to do. I didn't. I never had an office that owned a business before, and I and I didn't even hadn't really even thought of it. And we were about to move in, and um, somebody said, well, "What about the phone system?" And I went, Aye. "Fortunately, we have that great IT guy, Russell Tammany. You've seen him on our shows, and he says I've installed Ring Central. That's great. It's easy. Let's do it." And I said, "Deal." Producers get voicemail in their email. We can add people. We just added somebody to the phone tree that rings their cell phone if you want. All our fax messages on our smartphones. I love it. Try it free. RingCentral.com. Use a promo code TWIT or call 800-543-9980. RingCentral.com. Oh, we've got lots of calls, and I apologize. Kind of, I kind of uh, gabbed for on and on. Uh, so let's get right to the calls. Robin Burbank, your first Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Hey, Rob. Hey, Leo. How's it going? Great. Welcome. Yeah, it's been my uh, my lifelong dream to talk to you. <laughs> oh, come on. <laughs> uh, well, maybe it's an item on the bucket list. Yeah, yeah. Um, so had a question about Google Authenticator. Mm-hmm. Started using it around the, the time uh, when all that Matt Honan stuff started blowing yes, up. Yes, me too. I love it. Yeah. Yeah, and it, uh, I'm loving it, too. It's working great. Although uh, this morning I've just been kind of learning a little bit more about how it works. And uh, I've got uh, you know uh, some concerns, and I'm wondering what your take on it is. Um, All authenticators are doing the same thing. So let me explain what an authenticator is. Whether you get a dongle uh, from PayPal, uh, a card from VeriSign, I also have one of those, or you get the Google Authenticator, which is an application that you run on your Android phone. Um, the idea is all the same. It's a time-based, one-time-use passcode. So right, and that's kind of contrary to how I thought it was working. I, I used to think that, that, like, while the authenticator was running, data was moving back and forth between Google and. No, uh, there's no data moving at all. Right. Yeah, it's ba- it's uh, both ends are just doing the same mathematical calculation that's and right. coming up. Six digits. That's right. And now, every 30 what, seconds, those six digits change. It's uh, paired with the time of day. Is it possible to reverse engineer it and come up with that original key? Uh, no, because you don't know the algorithm that they've used. Okay, so that's just... And some... the, the technique that they uh, generally use for these is a one-way hashing. And that's a really cool technique to know about. So... Simply put, 
um, think of it as a um, as a uh, let me think um, a sausage grinder. That's a one way hash as well. You can't you can't put ham a, 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 a cut of meat into a sausage grinder. You get hamburger at the other end. You can't put the hamburger back through the sausage grinder and get a steak at the other <laughs> end. It's a one way street, right? Same thing with these hashing algorithms. Just because you have the six figure six digit result on your Google Authenticator does not mean you can go backwards and figure out what the key is that they're, they're, that they're working off of. So even like getting hundreds of them, that wouldn't help nope. anything. You no. Know, nope. There were now these- some hashing algorithms have been cracked with something called rainbow tables, and uh, but this this is not crackable in that sense. I don't believe a rainbow table is a giant book or database of hashes from each side and saying this one matches this one, this one matches this one, this one matches this one. And it's if you have a big enough database, then you have a chance that if you have the results, you can look in the rainbow table and say, oh, well, this is the original. And they generate those by running the hashes, right? The, the, right. It, it's impractical to do that with a good hash because there's so many initial values that you cannot go backwards. So uh, you're, 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 you're really, um, I think, absolutely secure and... Remember, it's only half of the equation. The person for all the idea, this is called what we call and really is a good system, two factor authentication. For instance, I'm showing right now my on my Verisign identity key. The, you generate it, it's a it's a little this thing is a little credit card, and you just press the uh, number, the the thing on it. It's got a tiny processor and it, a little bit of firmware in it, and every time you press the button, it generates a new key. Now I can show you that key because it's useless unless you know the password too so it's two factor authentication the factors are there there are three common factors something you know something's in your head like a password something you have like your cell phone or this authenticator card or a dongle or something you are and that would be biometrics that would be your fingerprint or your iris scan those are the three commonly used kinds of authentication if you could have there it is possible in the very secure environments like military installations they might do three factor You'd need a password. You'd also need a card that did a one-time number, and they do an iris scan. The more factors, the more difficult it is to uh, impersonate you because you'd have to have all three things. Same thing with this. You might have, you might, let's say you could reverse engineer that key. You'd still need my password, my login and password. So it's only half of the equation. You, you, basically, you can trust Google Authenticator. It works. It's very effective. Okay, yeah, uh, I guess uh, and, uh, they pretty much did think of everything. <laughs> it's a great um, question. I was just... Nothing's perfect, by the way, and I'll tell you where this is imperfect. And going back to the uh, SMS text. Uh, uh, well, that's the same, uh, that's very, and that works too, but that's not perfect either because your SMS can be spoofed. So yeah, I guess it's not, what a hacker could do is they can call your cell company and say, Hey, this is Rob. I lost my phone. <laughs> Please transfer all <laughs> SMSs to this number. And they'll do it without much authentication. And that's the hole in all of these is because humans lose these cards, they almost all of these systems have a way to get around them. And that's really the weak link, not the, not the uh, authenticator. But if you, if you, for instance, if you're on PayPal and you're using an authenticator, which I do on PayPal, there's a little link that says, click here if you've lost your authenticator. And then you go through some other steps, right? <laughs> this is how Matt Honan got hacked. Mm-hmm. Is he, they, they, the, the Apple asked the hacker for the security questions, and the hacker said, I forgot. So Apple said, no problem. Do you know the last four digits of the credit card on file and your mailing address? And the hacker said, oh, I know that, because they'd gotten that from Amazon. So the real weak link in these things is not is not this second factor authentication. The Google Authenticator is great. I use it for LastPass. I use it for Google. I also Blizzard.net had the, you know the, uh, the World of Warcraft uh, servers have second factor authentication. I use their Authenticator because that keeps people out of my out of my mm-hmm. uh, Diablo three account. Um, believe it or not, those are very popular. People hack those all the time. Those are good. Yeah, what's What's the weak link is that extra check link that says, did you lose the authenticator? Check, click here. Okay. Oh, sorry, you lost the authenticator. Well, what's your maiden, your, your mom's maiden name? 
You know, the, they go, they fall back to very weak authentication, and uh, hackers know that. So that's really the problem, more so right. than anything else. Yeah, well, if someone can just solve that puzzle and figure out, uh, you know, how to do away with the weak links. Well, the, it's very simple, but nobody wants to do it. The simple solution is to not have that link that says, did you lose your authenticator? The simple solution would be to say to you, Rob, Rob, I'm going to give you an authenticator, but if you lose it, you are out of luck. There's no back door. But the problem is no company is willing to do that, no bank. So let's. I used a dual-factor authentication on my bank. I do, in fact. And uh, they SMS me something. But there's. Oh, but the bank doesn't want me to say, hey, I can't access my account. Help me. Well, sorry, we can't help you. You, you. you screwed up. They always want to be able to help me, right? Right. Well, that helps hackers, too. Well, I guess, in, you know, in that scenario, the only thing that you should be able to do is just walk on into a branch and uh, prove who you are to them. Yeah. Make it hard. Make that make that fallback a pain. And there's a number of ways to do that. For instance, you, you know, there's that link, I forgot my password. Well, they send you an email right away. What would be a good idea is to wait three days. And then uh, the hacker would have to crack your account and wait three days. Meantime, you have a shot at, at uh, protecting yourself. But nobody's going to do that because it's inconvenient. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Yeah. Uh, the, I, the death of G4 we're talking about in the chat room. Interesting. That was inevitable. You know, you can tell a cable channel's doing badly. In fact, this was the this was how we knew tech TV was doing badly when they start running cheap uh, content. So, what was G four mostly? It was N American Ninja, really old episodes of Cops, uh, and they only had I think two original shows by the end. So, what that tells you is they they're making no money. G four is not gone. They're pivoting. Which is, in a, you know, everybody pivots. Bravo pivoted. A&E pivoted. It kind of makes me mad. Bravo was supposed to be car cultural uh, arts and entertainment, was supposed to be arts and entertainment. They're both doing reality crap. Housewives, you know, um, you know, mob wives. And so G4 is going to be a man channel, just like Spike. Spike, <laughs> Spike wasn't Spike. What was Spike before that? It's TNT, right? Um it, it, a lot of channels uh, do these kinds of things because, frankly, it's um, cable's expensive, and ultimately the only thing that sells is is uh, cleavage. In fact, we, it was very sad when we um, I was doing the screensavers in 2002, I think, and um, I was the uh, uh, at the time I was uh, managing editor. I was responsible for all content, and. Uh, they brought in a Hollywood producer, very nice guy, I like him, still a friend, Paul Block, um, because they felt like, well, we need to dress this show up. And uh, it, it started going more mainstream. And one of the things Paul told us, he said, well, you know, the consensus is that the show needs more cleavage. And that's really what, that's what really is wrong with... Uh, uh, television. And it's what's wrong with trying to reach a mass audience. The, the costs of doing cable TV are so expensive that you have to reach a very mass audience. The mass audience is the lowest common denominator audience, right? The only way you can reach 5 million people is by cleavage. So watch what they do. I mean, when they say GQ, that's BS. It's going to go sexy, as it always does. Uh, and it's really sad. So, but what we've, so what we, so I learned a lot from that, and that's why I did do Twit. It's not a cable channel, so the costs are much lower. Our costs are, we probably have a run rate of a um, couple million, maybe a one and a half to a couple million a year. That's compared to Tech TV's run rate of 50 to 100 million a year, depending on the year. They lost 100 million a year. Um, so I'm, um, you know, 150th of the cost. Which means I can be profitable, and this is the key, with one fiftieth of revenue. Tech TV was never profitable; it couldn't be profitable. They showed a, uh, a paper profit in the last quarter because they were trying to sell it, but and they did that by faking it, basically. 
Um, so the key is to be, it's, you know what? It's just business. It's business. <laughs> if, you, if something costs you $100 million or even $50 million a year to produce, do the math. It means you need to make $55 million a year in advertising. And you could do the math on that. Well, how do I make $55 million a year in advertising? You only sell so many units, so each unit has to cost a certain amount. At television, advertising is sold as a cost per thousand eyeballs or viewers. You could do the math all the way down. And you know you need you need a million viewers. You need, to be profitable, you need a one share. And uh, that's at least a million viewers. And... Um, Can't do it. Not with a tech show. Hey, Leo. Yeah. Your live read here is going to be Nod32. Excellent. Excellent. And also, real quickly, uh, Scott Wilkinson called last segment and just told me that he's traveling and sent you a note. Okay. If he could do tomorrow, that would be great. Yep. Cool. See, love is, in fact, one of the most commonly used passwords. <laughs> uh, some, you know, uh, somebody took a list of passwords and uh, did a little analysis on it, and and came up with what the most they do this periodically. The most commonly used passwords are. By the way, hackers do this particularly. Uh, they love this because uh, what they'll do is they'll immediately try those first twenty. And uh, and try to crack those. So the top, let me just tell you by popularity, and if one of these is yours, <laughs> you might want to change it. Number one password. This is uh, from um, a security firm called Rocku.com. Um, they had a security breach. This uh, Actually, it wasn't a security firm. It was a company called Rocku.com. had a security breach. Uh, they, that uh, in 2009, so this is from 2009, it might have changed, of 32 million passwords. So a security firm named Imperva Application Defense Center, or ADC, analyzed those 32 million passwords and uh, found that nearly a third of the users, one-third, chose passwords of six letters or less. Almost 60% of users, almost two-thirds, chose passwords from a limited set of alphanumeric characters. Half of the users used names, slang words, words from the dictionary, or obvious passwords. Uh, what's an obvious password? Well, the number one password out of this database was one two no one two three four five six. The second number one password was one two three four five. Well, that's easier. It's, it's one less. The third most common password was. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Oh, that's more secure. <laughs> the fourth most common password in Fraser, you're right. It was password. For servers, yeah. For servers that's number one. Because because servers are run by trained professionals. So they go right to number four. Number five, I love you. Number six, princess. Number seven, rock you. Now, this was from a database of rockyou.com. So that's why rock you's in there. Then number eight, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Number nine, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And number 10, A, B, C, one, two, three. <laughs> so if any of those were your passwords, you might want to change them. Um, Smart Planet has an article, the 20 most common passwords of all time. Uh, I think it's the same. Yeah, it's the same database. There's periodically, these databases will get leaked out, and, uh, and experts can uh, work on them to find the most common passwords. Monkey's very popular, apparently. <laughs> Don't use I used to, You know why I know that? Because that's why I used to use that for years. 8888-ASK-LEO. That's the phone number. Talk, we've been talking about security. Jim in Fremont uh, wants to know something. Hey, Jim Leo Laporte, the tech guy. 
Hey, Leo, thanks very much for taking my call today. Uh, first of all, I just really want to commend you for all the great work you do acting as a resource for the tech, community, the tech community, but really explaining our crazy tech industry to the general public. I think if uh, the tech industry, like the Academy Awards, ever has a Lifetime Achievement Award, I think you ought to be nominated. I think well, you're really doing great. I, I doubt they ever will, but <laughs> thank you. It's very kind of you. It's enough for you to say so, Jim. Thank you. So uh, here's my easy question for you. I'm thinking about writing a blog, and I wanted to know what you might recommend. Uh, I know there's a lot of different uh, options out there. The more difficult question is I've got a day job like a lot of us or some of us do these days, and I'm interested in write, maybe writing a little bit about politics, and I really don't – I want a firewall between those two things. So That's I a great idea, like yeah. So what do you think? What are the what are the really uh, what are the options? So let me, let me underscore that this is completely legitimate and not and people sometimes say, oh, there should be no anonymity on the net. And admittedly, anonymity calls problems because they're people control and do, you know, they can act out in ways that, you know, you wouldn't if, if people knew it was you. But there are absolutely good reasons for anonymity. You have a good one right there. Um, whistleblowers, uh, people, women who don't want to be stalked by, you know, uh, abusive husbands. There's lots of reasons why you might want anonymity on the net, and they're perfectly legitimate. So let me underscore that. It, on Having said that, it's easy to get basic anonymity, much harder to get anonymity from somebody who's determined, particularly if that person has subpoena power. And the reason is, let's say... Let's say you created a Twitter account, just as a trivial example, and you use the name, uh, you know, Brother Joe. Uh, and, uh, you know, Twitter doesn't know who you are. You used an, you make up an e not make up, but you use a, uh, an email address, say, at Yahoo Mail that you created. And you try to eliminate all ties back to you personally. That works fine for probably for your employer, for the casual person. But if it's a law enforcement official who has subpoena power, they can track that account back to the the IP address, the internet, the one and only unique internet address that was used when that account was created, they get another subpoena because the IP address tracks back to the internet service provider, and they get another subpoena and go to the internet service provider and say, so who was using that IP address at this date and time, and they got you. So anonymity is easy unless you're saying, I want anonymity from a government official or law enforcement, anybody with subpoena power. Congress. Now, I presume that you don't need that. Yeah, I don't need that. I don't yeah. need that. Uh, it's more just for, you know, how can I not be known, you know, as a someone who's working for a business, but, um, you know, writing uh, political comments, something like right, that. So, right. kind of general. But from a technology perspective, as you know, techs are pretty good about digging stuff up. They need, I, they really, they, you know, the good news is, and I would suggest, by the way, using Blogger, which is a Google uh, uh, blogging system, because Google has, be, has is very well known to be very protective of privacy. If they receive a subpoena, sometimes they even reject those. So, uh, you, and, in fact, they're also very transparent. You can go to Google and look at what government requests they receive, what ones they've honored, and so forth. So if you don't expect a government subpoena, I, you're absolutely secure if you're using, let's say, Blogger. Okay. Some companies are not so careful. Some companies, you know, say, yeah, whatever you want, anytime. Your Internet service provider may be a weak link here, by the way, uh, because often Internet service providers uh, are very compliant. In fact, some Internet service providers, I suspect most, are running a box in the, in the wire closet that was provided by the FBI that's logging everything without subpoena, without warrant. Um, so don't do it at work <laughs> because uh, every bit of traffic that goes through your work computer is probably being monitored. It certainly can be monitored legally by your boss. Um, if you want to hide your IP address, so I, I do, I do the monitoring. So I know exactly what's going oh, on. You're, oh, well, you, you know what? I don't have, then you know exactly what they're capable of. I do. And the law protects that, by the way. When you're using work computers, work internet, the, the um, uh, uh, ironic because if, for instance, I'm the boss and I and somebody I see my employee on the phone, I can pick up the phone. But the minute I hear that they're having a personal conversation, the law requires me to hang up. Not so in email, internet traffic, or anything like that. All digital stuff is wide open. The boss can look at any of it. Courts have held that time and time again, as you know. So my advice is, if you really want to be private, go to an Apple store, <laughs> create the blogger account at the Apple store, or anywhere with an open access point, a Starbucks. 
because then you're fairly anonymous. Uh, if you do it from an Apple computer at the Apple Store, you're really anonymous. Make the email, make a Gmail um, account because you need an email account uh, for the password recovery. Um, use a complete, you know, do it at an anonymous spot. Then create the blogger account logged into that Gmail account at an anonymous spot. And Apple Store is a great place to do it because they let you use the computers. You can, you know, kind of un unattendedly do that. A, a library would be equally good. Yeah, and then good never idea. go back there. <laughs> never again. Yeah, because, you know, you know, this is how, you know, pretend you're Jason Bourne. You don't want to get caught. You have no patterns. Patterns are what gets you caught. So don't go back there. Go to somewhere else. I was thinking about using this program that I read about called Tor. What do you think about that? Yeah, Tor has its uh, limits. It stands for the Onion Router, and the idea is, like an onion, uh, when you use a Tor service, Electronic Frontier Foundation runs one, by the way, for this exact purpose, for political dissidents in countries where uh, free speech is suppressed, they can log into this to one end of the Tor router, and then all their traffic is routed through multiple servers so effectively to anonymize it, then it comes out the other end. And the only thing that law enforcement can do if they want to really track it all the way back is get a subpoena to each of those servers. And usually it's so many in so many different locales that that's not doable. There are flaws in Tor, and the flaws are the beginning and the end. But that's a, that's a, a conversation for another day. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. No, I didn't get the ad. But I will. Gosh darn it. But I did get a salad. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Man, I'm I'm being serious. Here's a science fiction hand. scenario. What if you could take care of hand and foot? All right. I think this would be a very good time to mention Gazelle. Because we got a new iPhone coming, don't we? Now, the iPhone that's coming out on Wednesday is still an unknown quantity. That means that the price for old iPhones is still not at its bottom. It will be soon. It'll go lower every day after that. I guess that's kind of a truism. Gadgets never gain in value. But I got a, I got a pro tip for you. If you're thinking you want the new iPhone, don't wait. Now, today, right now, get a quote from Gazelle. These quotes are good for 30 days. Let's say, oh, I got the old iPhone 4S on AT&T. I want to sell it. It's 32 gigs. 280 bucks right there. Boom. They pay the shipping. Boom. They wipe your data. Boom. It's good. Flawless condition is even more. 295 bucks. Then you put it in the box and you look for more stuff that you can get rid of. Maybe an iPod. You know, we've got new iPods coming out. Uh, they take broken iPhones even. MacBooks. Macs. Cell phones of a variety of different manufacturers. Get your cash on, baby. Got a Nokia phone? Maybe now's the time to dump that sucker. <laughs> G-A-Z-E-L-L-E dot com. Gazelle's a great company. They've, they, over the last uh, few years, um, they have sold for people or given money to uh, 300,000 customers, about $50 million dollars in amount paid off to people who've sold their stuff to Gazelle. Keep it moving. They pay the shipping on any gadget worth more than a buck. Your choice uh, for pay is very simple. You can get a check, PayPal. But my suggestion is to go for that Amazon gift card. Why? Because they'll add 5% to the value. So Gazelle, they always do a lot of advertising right before the new iPads, <laughs> the new iPhones, the new iPods, because they know. And I'll tell you, now's the time because it's not going to get, it's not going to be worth more in three days. It's going to be worth less, maybe a lot less. G a z e l l e dot com, the best way to recycle. Gazelle dot com. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. I think that's probably the best way. If you wanted to be a really anonymous blog, go to a library or an, or an Apple store or Starbucks, create a Gmail Starbucks. account. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. That gives we'll you a blogger account automatically. Um, don't tie it to your cell phone. 
You're going to have to take a risk that, you know, I don't think you'll be able to do, uh, I guess you could do second factor. It's a little risky to do that. Don't do it on your computer. Do what Jason Bourne would do. And then you can, and then always log on from a different non-work computer to that blogger account. And just remember that if, if uh, I think that would even, that would even, you'd have to be, a government would have to be very determined. We'll begin at six minutes past the hour from Premier Radio Networks. The problem with a VPN is while you can't see the traffic inside, can you not see the origin point? I think you can. Oh, yeah, you could use a proxy router. Yeah, a VPN proxy. That's what a Tor basically does, yeah. 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 That's the question is, do you want to be 100% undetectable or do you just want to be somewhat secure? It's easy to be somewhat secure. It's trivial. From Premier Radio Network. The question is against a determined foe. <laughs> see, a tunnel, I think a tunnel doesn't work because you can see both ends of the tunnel. So a tunnel is not good for anonymizing. It's good for encrypting. A not, that's why Tor is tricky because a Tor, it's, it does anonymize. The theory of it is anonymization, but the, the problem is the endpoints. This is and they're Channel often 7. subpoenaed. Leo Laporte, the tech guy, will begin at six minutes past the hour. From Premier Radio Networks. A tunnel protects you against deep packet inspection, though, yeah. So, yeah, I would use SSH anyway, and that's nice. It, you know, if you're doing Google, it's SSL. What would Jason Bourne do? That's the thing you should ask yourself. It's the best part of those movies. Is this just, is Premier Channel 7. Uh, you know, and, and I hope they get more and more technically sophisticated to, to watch how they, because sometimes they do things and it really bugs me, you know, that they just, you couldn't do, like, he taps into the camera system, you know. Jason Borg, Bourne would not have a blog. That is true. Why take the chance? Well, a good day to you, Leo Laporte here, the tech guy. Time to talk about computers, the internet. Anonymous blogging. Security. Cell phones. Home theater. All that jazz. If you tuned in for our home theater guru, Scott Wilkinson, he's on the road. He's traveling. He will be in tomorrow on the show in the first hour. So home theater time delayed by a day. I, I love the conversations we've been having. I know maybe they're a little uh, abstruse, certainly not something everybody needs to do. But I love the conversation about uh, security, about privacy, about protecting yourself online. This is, these are things it's good to know. For instance, it's, I think, important to know whether you need to do an anonymous blog or not, that your boss is legally entitled to spy on every digital communication you have at work, period. And you may think that you're protected uh, because you're on a secure HTTP connection, for instance. You're securely using Gmail. Boss can even get around that with what's something called a man-in-the-middle attack. And unless you know what to look for, you may not know he's doing it. Now, if you're a boss, as I am, um, I would say it would be a really, really good idea to have a published, written internet policy where you explain what you do and do not spy on. You're not, you're not required to do this, by the way. Courts do not require this. The law does not require this. I think it's just good policy. Tell your employees what's okay, what's not okay, and what you may or may not be doing in terms of spying. But since most employment employers don't do this, just be aware, especially if you're in a big company, that even if you're using your laptop on the corporate account, even if you're using a corporate laptop on your home account, they may well be spying on you. They have the right to be spying on you without notice. Furthermore, you should be aware that the, you know, people talk so much about privacy and, oh, my goodness, Google's spying on me. Or what does Google know? Or what is, you know, what do these advertisers know? You know, the real weak spot in all this is your Internet service provider. Because that's where all traffic goes. Not all traffic goes to Google. But all traffic goes through your internet service provider. And most internet service providers have very lax policies about privacy, about security. 
If somebody asks them, they'll often hand your name over without a court order. In many cases, as I mentioned, federal law enforcement has a box in there anyway that's watching everything you do. So if you're worried, if you're worried about privacy, I think it's a it's a red herring to say, oh, my browser, you know, cookies are tracking me. That's a red herring. Yeah, maybe they are. But I'd be more, I'd be more concerned about your internet service provider. And there's only a handful of internet service providers in this country who will really stand up to law enforcement and say, no, you you, you really have to have a court order to get that information. We are not giving up that information uh, unless you have, uh, you know legal authority to get it it's that's i think and i think that's important the phone co- if you're if your internet service provider is uh, a cable company or a phone company it, you, forget it <laughs> all the major phone companies verizon at&t have portals for law enforcement where the law enforcement official and it could be a meter made frankly can check in for a, a small amount, buck, buck fifty. Query uh, the phone company about you. There's some things they can't find out about because uh, the law still requires a warrant. But there's some things they can, like your location. No warrant required. Eighty-eight, eighty-eight. Ask Leo. It's good for us to know this. I think you know a lot of what I consider important. Uh, what I'm here for is to educate you about technology, and a big part of that is to is 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 a defensive thing. Is to know what is a what's a problem and what's not a problem. To be aware of what people can do and what they can't do. For instance, a lot of people say, "Oh, I don't want to use a credit card online." It scares me. It's not that risky. In fact. The real risk is when you go to a restaurant and the waiter takes your credit card and disappears for five minutes. What's he doing? You don't know. That's a lot, that's a lot more risky than using your credit card online, unless you're using it at hacker.com. I got a call uh, a couple of days ago from my bank uh, on my business card, and they said, yeah, we, we got a couple of weird charges. Uh, we just wanted to ask you, did you... <laughs> Did you make a $5 purchase with a charity in England and then shortly after that make a 50-cent purchase at a Hyatt in Arkansas, like within 30 seconds? I said, uh, no. <laughs> and they said, no. Uh, we, we flagged them. We turned them both down. We're going discon- to destroy your card. We're going to discontinue that number, and we're going to send you a new card. What it meant is that somehow that credit card number and the, and the and the CSV code and the and the uh, expiration date those are the three pieces they need along with my name the name on the card had leaked out probably into a database uh that was sold a lot of ways it could have leaked out I don't think it was Amazon which is where one of the places I used that card I think it was much more likely when I used that card at a restaurant but who knows the good news is that banks are uh, using software that is very quick to pinpoint these problems and identify them and call you right away. And the reason they flagged this is, it, uh, ter- as found out later, it's a very common thing if you've got a credit card in this database and you want to see if it's good to make a small contribution to a charity or a small purchase somewhere or both and see if it works. Uh, the reason that you do it in this English charity uh, as an example, the reason you do it with a charity is because they tend not to have really great <laughs> databases and systems. Um, and so you can all, you know, it's a good way to just, without getting in trouble, check it and make it small so they don't need to authorize it, right? I think it was actually 50 cents. Then they don't, they don't bother calling the bank. They don't bother checking. They say, uh, okay, well, let's run it through. And so these were test charges, small test charges, just to see if the card worked. And in different countries, by the way, Arkansas and the UK. But the good news is the bank software looks for things like that. I'm told there's other things that are red flags. For instance, filling up two cars, gas tanks at the same time is a red flag. Because often somebody who steals a credit card number <laughs> goes to the gas station, fills up their tank, fills up their friend's tank, maybe fills up another friend's tank all at the same time. Red flag! And that card will get flagged and they'll call you. Anyway, I I, I, <laughs> I tore up my card. They obviously got me. And I don't think it was online. 
But it's good for us to understand these things. So, you know, it, it's safe to use your credit card online. That, that, you don't, don't have to worry about that. Wayne and Irvine, Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Hi, Wayne. Hi, Leo. Welcome to the show. Oh, turn off that radio because that's going to confuse the heck out of you. You're going to hear what I said 40 seconds ago. Exactly. I'd put pressure the wrong button. That's okay. I have a printer problem. I'm hoping you can help me. All right. Uh, a uh, Pixima uh, MP160, and I'm running it off a uh, MacBook Pro. I I like, those are those Canon, very nice Canon photo printers, the Piximas. I like them. Yeah. Yep. And I've been getting, uh, lately, I'm getting some prints that are very faded, washed out, and I've tried... Uh, all sorts of things. I tried cleaning the print cartridge head. I tried putting a new color ink. I downloaded the current uh, driver. I did the Mac uh, deep cleaning. You know, I hate to say it. Uh, yeah. These printers can, and some some printer ink jet printer companies replace the head when you replace the cartridge. Canon mm -hmm. is not one of them, so uh, you've worn that printer out. Oh, <laughs> and getting time a, for new printer. yeah time for a new printer. Getting a new cartridge. Uh, doesn't fix that problem. It's just worn out. Okay. So what? any recommendations on what to replace it with? Uh, those are good. Uh, I like Epson a little bit better. That's mostly what I use. Um, I'm like scanning, too. Yeah, I, I use an Epson all-in-one scanner uh, that I love. Take a look at the Epsons. I think you'll be happy. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. No, you cannot replace the head on those Pixmas. They're trash, which really annoys the hell out of me. Uh, that's why I stopped buying Pixmas. I, I love the Pixma. It was a great photo printer. Canon makes great photo printers. But once that head wears out, there's no fix. You have to throw it out. And I think that and that does that after a couple of years. I think that's just unconscionable. So um, one of the reasons I use Epson, they don't do that. Chat, you get, of course, word processing. You can't clean the head. It's not the head. It's... Um, it's something, it's not a, it's more, it's, anyway, it's critical, it's not cleanable, it's worn out, and it's not replaceable. So, Mr. Cotter was just a screw up on our end for a Jolie O'Dell on Twit, um, miscommunication. Not Jolie's fault, not anybody's fault, but uh, it's miscommunication. You don't have a Pixma, that's why, Inglald. It's the Pixmas in particular, P-I-X-M-A's, that wear out. It's not the CSV, it's the CVV. I thought it was a CSV. Oh, really? It's never worn out? Oh, good for you. You mustn't use it very much. It is totally dependent on the number of pages you print. Yeah, I think the credit card companies have gotten pretty good. They're using um, very, I think, very sophisticated business intelligence software to monitor all those transactions, and it flags stuff fast. I think they've gotten very good. Um. Okay, so, Lou M.M., there's two different kinds of Epsons. Epson makes the very best photo printers. I mean, it's what all the pros use, but they're expensive. So uh, it's not die sub, but uh, it is a very high-quality inkjet print. that you and, and Epson makes the best papers. They can make acid-free papers. They have uh, long-life inks. So most photographers I know use Epsons. But that's not the same. I wouldn't use that printer for day-to-day -day printing because it's expensive. Um and yeah, that's one big difference between a laser and a inkjet. Laser printers have much longer life cycle, a uh, light duty cycle. So absolutely, if you want, uh, I, you know, what I would do, Lou, is I would get a printer for a laser, at inexpensive, they're cheap, laser printer for your black and white, you know, your printing needs. And then for your prints, your photo printing, just get a photo, uh, you know, a good photo printing uh, printer. Becky, I use an Epson laser that I like a lot. Um, we also have an HP laser in the office that's quite good. HP, for a long time, the laser jets really were the best. I don't know if they still are, but they really were. They're kind of metza metza. Who else do you like? The color ones are good, but not the black and white. Yeah, they used to make really, they were the best. Yeah. 
Uh, and everybody used, ironically, everybody used Canon uh, parts in their laser printers. Canon kind of invented the laser printer. I think the Epson workforce is good. One of the reasons I like it, the workforce, is it has uh, enough paper trays for two reams. And the ink cartridges are like this big. They're huge. Which means, you know, it's just it's a lower maintenance thing. Lexmark is che has cheap ink. Um, I st I think Canon makes excellent printers. I don't, I love the Canon uh, the Pixma a lot. I was a big fan of the Pixma, um, except that it wore out, and then I got an Epson. I think Brother makes very good uh, uh, inexpensive laser printers. I, you know, my blanket recommendation for scanners and printers is Epson. I just, I, I, I've never had trouble with it. It's like Dell, it's my blanket recommendation for PCs. It doesn't mean there aren't other good companies. Printer jam. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. <laughs> If you've got a printer jam, don't call me. Call, what do they call him, the key operator? <laughs> Leo Laporte, the tech guy. This is, this is like um, nerd, nerd, nerd Skrillex, nerd dub. Mary, Orange County, California, Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Hi, Mary. Hi, Leo. How are you doing? I'm well. How are you? I'm doing good. Boy, those last uh, two or three callers, the, two, la the first two callers were very, very interesting. Good. Um, I, I worry an, sometimes when we get really geeky like that. I don't want to tune people out. It's very interesting to me. I'm not a geek. Um, Good. All right. But at any rate, it was I think what ha I think, you know, the problem is in mainstream, uh, most mainstream media, which this is, but most of the time, they don't want to de deal with these very technical topics. But I think they're mm -hmm. important. So if I can, I like to bring them up. And if I can explain them in a way people can understand, I think that's good. So thank you. Can understand. Thank you. Right. So what can so, I do for you? I have an iPad 3, and I have a MacBook. And uh, I am also concerned about, about privacy and security. And I had put some um, personal notes on my iPad, and I have a Google, Google account. And all of a sudden, the other day, I noticed that my iPad notes were on my Google account. And I thought, <laughs> whoops. That's <laughs> exactly. Um, so I'm just wondering how I prevent that. I'm not sure how it happened. It's it's something that you would normally have to do. So the note application that you were using was what? Um, it, what do you mean the note? How do you it take just, notes? It, it was just on notes on my on my iPad. On the notes application from the iPad. Yes. Well, normally there would be no way that could get to Google. Period. Uh -huh. So, uh, you know, there are some applications, f the reason I asked, there are some applications that will save your data out, uh, on places other than the iPad. Because one of the problems with the iPad is getting data out, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, ah, I know where, I know how it happened. Thank you. NW in the chat room. Um, the, this was a change that Apple made recently to the iPad. Mm -hmm. uh, notes... And now sync through your email hmm. to your Mac. Uh -huh. You could turn this off. So when you said it got in your Google, it was in your Gmail. You saw it in your Gmail. I did. That's right. So so that's why that happened is because you have sync turned on for notes. Oh, okay. And and uh, pre prior to iCloud, the way it was doing this is it would assume that that note was effectively an email. Uh -huh. So it's being synced to your Gmail account and then from there synced to your desktop. But if okay. you don't want that to happen, just disable Notes Sync. Okay. It's in the settings. Um, now, the other thing is I'm running um, Snow Leopard on my Mac. And I would like to be able to print out uh, stuff that I put on my iPad. Right. And I'm told by Apple that I would have to upgrade to, I guess, Lion. Yeah, or have an HP printer. Hmm. So uh, I have a Canon, Canon printer. Yeah, um, and you probably can get an, an app from Canon. You should look and see if there's an app from Canon. Uh, uh -huh. 
HP supports something called AirPrint right out of the box. Or I should, it's probably the other way around that Apple supports HPs with their AirPrint right out of the box. But AirPrint mm -hmm. can print to other printers if you have a program on your computer designed for your Canon printer. So just search in the App Store for AirPrint and Canon. Okay. And uh, you should be able to find um, a drive. It's just like an application that sits on there. It's effectively a driver. And then you can then when you select print in your iPad, it will print right to your printer. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, By the well, way, that printer has to be on the network, obviously, or shared in some way. You, meaning... Uh, well, it's the way that the that the iPad would print is by seeing the printer on your network and saying, ah, there's uh -huh. a printer. So there's two ways to do that. If you have a network printer, a printer that's on Wi-Fi, and many of the mo most of the modern printers are Wi-Fi enabled, uh, then it'll work just out of the box. If not, then you have to go through your Mac. Your Mac has to be on. Your Mac has to be sharing that printer, et cetera, et cetera, mm -hmm. et cetera. Well... You know, I I don't like the idea of uh, my stuff being uploaded to the cloud unless I want it uploaded to the right, cloud. Right, right. And, um... Well, whenever you see the word sync uh -huh. on your settings, that's how it's doing it. That's how it's doing it. Okay. Yep. So, that, the, that's the trick. Can I ask you another quick question? Sure. How do you... I have AT&T as my ISP. Okay. Um, <laughs> that was pretty shocking what I heard. Let me tell you something. <laughs> there was a whistleblower for the NSA, the National Security Administration, uh -huh. uh, uh, who um, told the world that AT&T <laughs> was giving information about its customers to the National Security Administration. Oh, you're kidding. Yeah. That is unbelievable. So if you, you know, you search for NSA and AT&T, you, you'll be able to find, uh, find all of that. What about changing ISPs, I'm wondering? Um, I think they probably all do it. There, there are a handful that don't. Um, mm -hmm. You know, post 9-11, uh, everybody's kind of a little bit paranoid about terrorism, oh, and so sure. they, they, they're very quick to share with uh, the government. Anything the government wants, they pretty much do. Right. Yeah. Okay. So, but, you know, the question is, do you trust your government? If you don't trust your government, we're kind of messed up. I, I, we're, we're out of luck anyway, <laughs> you know. Well, I'm, I'm very concerned. <laughs> then you got to hunker down. Then you got to get the bunker in, the, in the South yeah. Dakota and hunker down because yeah. they got fingers in everything. Yeah, yeah. Sorry to be the bearer of bad tidings. There's an article. This happened in 2006. A whistleblower. By the way, I think there was a recent court case in which this whistleblower was... Uh, uh, protected, exonerated by the courts. His name was Mark Klein. He was a retired AT&T communications technician. Uh, he told the world that the National Security Agency was given full access to AT&T customers' phone calls, that AT&T shunted its customers' Internet traffic to data mining equipment installed in a secret room in its San Francisco switching center, uh, that AT&T did not require court order, that at and just merely said, oh, yeah, sure, wh wh whatever you want. I don't want to single out at and I think you can pretty much assume that every phone company did this. But this is widely known, um, you know, not a secret. Uh, I will put a link in our uh, show notes to this uh, article from Wired uh, magazine from 2006. Whistleblower outs NSA spy room, and you can... If you Google AT and T and NSA, you'll see you'll see all the uh, information. It's all it's all out there. It's not secret <laughs> anymore. <laughs> but I think you know if, 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 you, if we're worried about the government, we got we got big worries because uh, nobody nobody's going to say no to the NSA. NSA has been reputedly building a massive spy center. We don't know what the heck it's doing. Well, I'll talk about that when we come back. I'm, I'm not paranoid. I'm not. But, you know, it's good to know. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. I'm sorry, it's too far away. Oh, yeah. I hate it for Windows, though. Yeah, it's
it really only works on HP, you know, out of the box on HP. Uh, you know, Wi-Fi. Things. Yeah, that's the Wired article on that one. Biggest spy center. We don't know though, right? We don't know what this is for. Utah Data Center. Two billion dollars, up and running a year from now. The plan is to have, I believe, is to have uh, basically all electronic traffic go through this center at some point. And um, this is the TIA. If you want to know more about this, uh, look uh, look up TIA. Uh, and NSA, um, it's called uh, uh, Total Information Awareness, or Echelon is another uh, key word that will help you. And of course, by searching for those three words, I've now notified the TSA <laughs> that I am, in fact, <laughs> investigating Carnivore, Swift, TIA, <laughs> and Echelon. Here's a good. This is a good Ars Technica article from uh, 2008. By the way, notice that uh, there was a lot of talk about this, you know, four to five years ago, and then it got very quiet. Nobody talks about it anymore. But again, I'm not a conspiracy theorist, and I don't particularly fear the government. But uh, I do think, since the Patriot Act, the government has taken some extreme liberties. I'm so this meme that you see all the time on the internet now is you take a song and you take little clips from Star Trek or Star Wars or something or the president's speeches and you make that the lyric. So now I know the song is never going to give you up, but what, 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 what are the clips from, uh, Kyle? Madman did it this week. Or Mad Men. Mad Men. Oh, I like it. The TV show Mad Men. So... Have I been Rick Rolled? I believe I have. <laughs> is it if it's not Rick Astley though? If you play the song "Never Gonna Give You Up," but it's not Rick Rick Astley singing it, I don't know if that counts as a Rick Roll. That's a meme from a long time ago. Remember Rick Rolling, where you would uh, put a link into a chat room or an email that purported to be one thing. Hey, did you see the president's speech last night? And instead, you click the link. It's Rick Astley on YouTube singing, Never Gonna Give You Up. It was called Rick Rolling. How does this stuff happen? How does it become a meme? It just it, it just tickles people in some weird way. And um, so that's a Mad Men role, which sounds like a kind of sushi. But uh, uh, continuing on with the calls, Jamie in Temecula, California, our next caller. Hi, Jamie. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Hi, Jamie. Hello. Hello. Hi, Leo. Hi, Jamie. How are you? Um, I am a history teacher. Okay. And I, a French teacher at our school, introduced something to me yesterday, and I'm not very um, tech savvy. Hmm. And what she does is she puts all of her lectures on the Internet. She has a web-based program. Great idea. And she videotapes them. Yeah. And she uses a tablet, which I I know nothing about having a tablet that you write on. Not required. Then, uh, not required, but I'll explain how you could do this without, you know, with whatever you've got. Okay. Um, and the, the main um, format that I teach is lecturing with PowerPoint. Mm. So I would like to be able to put the PowerPoint on the website right. with the lecture at the same time. So how would I do that? What software program would I get? And how difficult would it be? And what is the most cost-effective way that I could do this? This is, by the way, uh, to me, this is a, a wonderful trend in, uh, in teaching. Um, yeah. Sometimes it's called flipping. I don't know if you're flipping or not. But I have no idea what that is. It, this is I find it, and I don't know how well it would work with history. It works with some it, things better than others. The idea of flipping, and it was explained to me first on this show, and then I researched it, and then now I see it everywhere. Is you know, it used to be the lecture was in school, and you go home and do the homework. 
flipping Correct. flips it on its head. You do the lecture at home. You say your homework is to watch the video, and then they come back to school and they work with you. Because what is it? What is the real uh, value of a teacher? It's not the lecture. It's the one-on-one interaction with the student, right? Right. It's what the, the students do to learn, not what the teachers tell them. Bingo. So the idea of flipping is, all right, we'll make the homework be watching the lecture, you know, or reading the book or whatever it is. And then they come in and now we're going to have uh, peer-to-peer uh, teaching, you know, because students are often taught best by other students. Or maybe with help from the teacher or maybe the teacher works directly one-on-one with students or maybe we have discussion groups. Those are the things you have to do in a group. So t- it's right. flipping because it's flipping the model of homework, that the homework is more like the lecture and that the and the schoolwork is more like the homework. So in any event, I think I think recording a lecture is a great idea. In fact, my, I have a good friend who wants to reinvent uh, education, and one of the things he says is, look, why give the same, you know, in colleges, the same professors giving the same lecture year in, year out, get the best perfect professor doing the best lecture on that topic, record it, and then he never gives that lecture again. He teaches. <laughs> right. Right. So well, that makes- wouldn't, wouldn't this be nice? Anyway, uh, so let's help you do this. So there are a couple of ways to do this. Probably the easiest way to be do it at home, not in school. Um, uh, and there are screen cast programs or screen capture programs that would allow you to have your PowerPoint on the screen and an inset of you talking. So the full screen is okay. the PowerPoint, and then they see your face. And you can even, with some of these programs, switch. So you can say, okay, now I want to be full screen Jamie. And then now I want to be full screen PowerPoint. Now I want to be little Jamie. Or or mix it up like that. Okay. Now you're on Windows, I presume, since you're using PowerPoint. I am. So uh, one program, and I think that if you could get a corporate or a corporate, an educational discount on this, this would be a, a good choice, is Adobe's Captivate. It's designed to do this. But it's not a cheap program, but I bet you that you can get a educational, dis- a significant educational discount on this. Okay. So it's called Captivate. Yeah, and it's designed really to do this. Um, it's e-learning. They even call it e-learning software. Okay. So that's one solution. Um, there are less expensive solutions like Camtasia from TechSmith that's simply a screen okay. recorder. So so that would be... Now, Adobe has great educational discounts. They want teachers to use Captivate. So I would... I uh, You know, it's expensive is the, is the negative, but your school might, uh, you know, say, hey, this is a good idea. Maybe they can get it for you. I don't know what the situation is. Unfortunately, yeah, we... Yeah, are pretty know, much out of money right I know. Now. It breaks my heart, especially in California. Because there is nothing more important than education. Nothing. Yeah. And, uh, and a little... Go ahead. Sorry. No, I'm just... Uh, go ahead. You go ahead. You're the teacher. <laughs> <laughs> Teach me, teacher. <laughs> <laughs> the, the other big disadvantage we have is we're in a uh, district where the kids are very economically um, challenged. The people who have... need education the most. Yes. And, and get the worst. And so much of this I may have to put on disk because some may have computers, but they may not have, many of them do not have the internet. Ah, this is good. So you would need to make it a DVD available. Yeah. Yeah, flipping yes. does kind of assume that kids have access to high-end technology. So you're right. It, in, a, in a disadvantaged school district, that might not be a good assumption to make. Right. So I'm mainly looking for it for those that are out on absences or the kids that I teach that um, may be um, RSP kids. Right, right. Be great for RSP, the the dyslexic kids or the learning disabled kids who really could benefit from this. Yeah, or English language learners. Right. They can watch it over and over until they understand it. Yes. Okay, so if if I had, okay, so that software, and then what I need to, um, just to make the time constraint, um, to make it easier, I'd sort of like to do it while I lecture. So that would be year. a little bit different. So then you would get a camera, a video camera. Could be your phone, by the way. It doesn't have to be anything too fancy. Nowadays, camera phones actually are pretty good for video. But you could also get an ex- inexpensive camcorder. And then you would, would want to set that up. Your PowerPoint, I presume, is on a big screen in front of the classroom. You could okay. just record your lecture. And as long as when you record it, you make sure that the PowerPoint is clearly visible... I think you'd be fine. 
Okay. And then to be able to put it, and then what I need, then I would use that software program that you told me. You to wouldn't know. To- you wouldn't need that. That's for doing it from your computer. If you're just recording yourself, you could use Windows Movie Maker. It's free from live.com, get.live.com. It's Microsoft's free Windows Movie Maker. And you can use that to just cut it up, put titles on it. I would title it. The better, the better you do it with the production, the more attractive it'll be. And then you can burn it from that to a DVD. Make it very easy. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Oh, I really want to support her in doing that. Well, Sophia, there's two. So there's two things. Uh, if she's just tape recording herself giving the speech, it's all in sync, right? She's just basically giving a kid a recording of what happened in the classroom, and that's fine. The nice thing about a screencast with something like Captivate is that your um, quality is better, and you have a little more control, and you could even zoom in on the PowerPoint and things like that. So Captivate really is almost like um, it's you know it's 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 more work. It's hot. It's it, it's interactive. You can do all sorts of stuff with it. So um, that's one choice. Camtasia is uh, probably a, a simpler choice. Um, that's a screen recording program. Whoops, wrong prey, wrong prey, wrong place. It's expensive too, though. You know, both both of these are about three hundred bucks. But this would record the screen, and then let you edit it. This would also allow you to uh, put it on DVD as well as YouTube. No, the other teacher had a tablet. Yeah, the French teacher was using a... Yeah, right. No, the French teacher was using her tablet. Um, she she saw that and said, hey, I'd like to do that. But, you know... So there, there uh, there's not... You know what? Video editing, open source software is fairly weak in the video editing realm. <laughs> Oh, David Lee Roth, Leo Laporte, the tech guy, 8888, ask Leo's the phone number. I love this idea, you know, of uh, of uh, recording uh, lectures so that you can, and by the way, this has taken off in the higher education world like crazy. There's Coursera.com, have you seen this? C-O-U-R-S-E-R-A dot, I'm sorry, dot org, because it's a non-profit uh, higher education that overcomes the boundaries of geography, time, and money. Take the world's best courses online for free. Brilliant. And some of the best, best universities, Stanford, Princeton, Yale, University of Pennsylvania, University of Illinois at Urbana. Uh, this is amazing. University of California, San Francisco, University of Edinburgh, Rice, Georgia Institute of Technology. École Polytechnique Fédérale de Lausanne. That's Switzerland, right? Caltech. You could take a Caltech course in computer science absolutely free, and this is a college-level course. Or Stanford. Or Penn. I mean, I love this. So this Coursera, C-O-U-R-S-E-R-A dot org, there's other uh, similar things. There's one called, I think it's, uh, let me make sure, Udacity, I think, dot com. Uh, this is uh, a, a unique and new way of learning, mostly focused on uh, technology. And by the way, these many of these would be fo- completely appropriate for second secondary school kids. The smarter secondary school, school kids would love this. Intros to computer science, statistics, programming languages, Differential equations. It, there's no excuse now. There's no excuse. If you can't afford college, and most people can't, or many people can't, if you can't get to, you know, you're, you're busy working a 50-hour work week, if you want to get an education and you have access to the Internet, you can. Khan Academy. Amazing. This really was what started the revolution. K-H-A-N Academy.org. This, this is free. Courses in, and these are for high school kids for the most part. Everything from finance and economics 
to math and science. Just amazing stuff. I'm just a huge fan. So check it out. Khan Academy, Coursera, Udacity, uh, and iTunes U. If you've got iTunes on your computer, iTunes U has a ton of university and uh, high school level courses. Love it. One of our chatters, Brian N.W., works at UCSF and says he, he works on the Coursera courses. I think Coursera is very exciting. Very, very exciting. And this is, this is the, uh, I think, the beginning of a transformation in education. You know, we've really, we've really failed in many ways. The, one of the things that made, I think, made the U.S. great was uh, this dedication to free education. That every that it's what makes a good citizen. That every person has the right and to some degree obligation to get an education, so they can be infor- an informed electorate, so they can get a better job. And it it really was the the spine of this nation. It was what made this nation great, and we've really turned our back on it. I'm sorry to say, we got to fix education. And you know what's going to happen? It's not going to happen in the schools. It, it's going to happen on the internet, like so many other things. 8888-ASK-LEO, that's the phone number. John's in Huntington Beach, California. Hi, John. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Hey, Leo. How you doing? I'm great. Welcome. Okay, I got a question for you. Okay, every time I log on to the internet, and I have a, window, a gateway with Windows 7s, and every time I go into my Yahoo uh, search engine and I type in, a uh, say, like a website, it'll go to that link. And when I click the link, the, it comes up, Internet Browser Unable the Web Page. And I was wondering, maybe you can help me out with that. Did you say you use Yahoo for search? Well, I use Yahoo. Uh, I'm just my... curious. I've never, I haven't met anybody who uses Yahoo for search in a long time. So that's good. No, it doesn't matter. It shouldn't. That, that's irrelevant. I, I'm sorry. I didn't even, I shouldn't have said a thing. Um, the well, issue. You know, I use Yahoo, Bing, and, you know, uh, Google, but, you know, I. Okay, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, you see, what I do is uh, when I get my messenger, I click the mail, and then I use that, you know, to yeah. do my searching. Okay, because like I said, every time that I... Uh, Let me ask you a couple in, of questions. Can you enter in a, a, a website into your browser and go there? Yeah, so the thing is that I can, I can go to the link that, say, like, the, whatever I want to, you know, use. I see. It's just clicking the link that doesn't work. Yeah, you, when I click the link... It, it comes up, Internet browser, unable to open the web page. Right. Well, Windows does this in a very complicated way. What what happens with Windows is it uh, it treats a link like it would a document. You know when you double-click a word processor document, Windows actually has to look up in a database, it's called a file association database, what application owns that document, and then open that application and then tell the application as it's opening, oh, and by the way, would you open this document? And that all happens behind the scenes. It's exactly the same mechanism that's used for opening links in email or uh, other places. And it's broken, obviously. My question is, why is it broken? And the first thing I, I suspect when I hear things like this is, uh, is malware. Because, of course, one of the things malware wants to do is interrupt this and say, oh, and by the way, on the way to that site, would you mind stopping off at pokerfunforall.com? Because we'll get seven cents if you do. So I, I always worry when I hear this. Now, it may not be malware, by the way. But, it, but the first thing you should do, John, is check to make sure you don't have any malware on there. If you have an up-to-date antivirus, you're probably okay. There's a malicious software removal tool, a scanner that Microsoft puts on all recent versions of Windows. As long as you update Windows monthly, I hope you're doing that. Uh, You can start that off by pressing the Windows R key and typing MRT, one word, MRT in the box, and hitting return. That will run the malicious software removal tool to a thorough scan. If if that comes up clean and you have an up-to-date antivirus, then you don't have malware. Then we can move on to the the rest of this. But a, a good MRT scan is not a bad thing for any, anybody to do. So let me let me tell you how to do that one more time. Windows key R, or click run from the start menu. Either thing, it's the same thing. Windows key R pops up a little run box and type MRT, one word, MRT, hit return, do a thorough scan. You'll get an application running, do a thorough scan. 
and see how you feel. If you feel okay after that, then you're probably all right. Um, there are other programs you can run. I always get nervous recommending uh, other programs because you go out on the Internet and download programs. If you do this wrong, you might be downloading something that's malware itself so you can reinfect yourself. So I don't generally say, but I'm going to say it, but please type this carefully, Malware Bytes, M-A-L-W-A-R-E, B Y T E S dot org. All right. Don't go to another site. Don't Google malware bytes and pick and pick a link. Uh, because the bad guys know people use this and uh, and they put, you know, malicious versions of it out. You want to make sure you get it from malwarebytes.org. That's another malware scanner that's that's really good and, and often finds these browser issues. However, if you go through all these and they all come up clean, then it's the file association database just got messed up. And these things can happen spontaneously, unfortunately. Fixing it is non-trivial. <laughs> I, don't, I don't even want to recommend it. You know, go to your software restore and try to go back in time, maybe. set it, If you have a restore point that's uh, a, a set before you, this all started happening, go back in time. You can go into the file associations database and try to fix it. It's kind of a pain. Um, that's th those are the recommendations I can give you. Anything else is going to take me an hour to explain. That's neat, Brian. That looks really good. What did you say? Twenty thousand people have signed up for that nutrition course. That's amazing. That's amazing. Summertime is over. Sorry, <laughs> sorry. Time to get back to the work groove. That's this is now. That's what this is the example of how powerful this tool is. More than twenty thousand people are signed up for one class. And this platform lets that happen. So Katie can give a class that normally might have 100 kids in it. Uh, and anybody can take this. It's free. Really great. I can see why people would want to take this. And you can get a certificate. I don't know what good that is, but you can get it. <laughs> She's got a master's in public health. She's a registered dietitian. This is great. Certified diabetes educator. If you're interested in nutrition, nutrition, what a great, uh, what a great course. So he could also have security software. Martin says that's true. A security software, a vast is such a piece of crap. <laughs> You don't you know, a lot of that's the issue is that if you you know you want college credit you want a degree you're going to be paying a university that's what you're paying for essentially not the education you're paying for the, the certificate the degree well a good day to you Leo Laporte here the tech guy and it's time to talk about computers the internet cell phones and camcorders home theater MP3 players and all that jazz 88. 88 ask Leo is the phone number. 888-827-5536. Toll free from anywhere in the U.S. Give me a, a yingle. Let's talk. Back to the phones we go. Chris in Valencia. Hey, Chris. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Hey, Chris. Hey, Leo. Love your show. Thank you, sir. Hey, I have a question. I'm trying to sync iCalendar for my iPhone to my Mac. And what's happening is it's thinking to my wife's profile. So we have two profiles on the Mac and two separate Apple IDs. And That's the key. It's a, it's doing everything through your Apple ID or your iCloud account. But, but what's interesting is, is I'm able to sync my contacts to my account, but it syncs the iCalendar to my wife's account. So you got to check your settings and see what, you know, it may be, for instance, that the iCal is syncing to something else besides iCloud. It might be syncing to your Google Calendar, and if that's the case, maybe it's getting it from there. It's it's not it's not going to do anything on its own. <laughs> Let's put it that way. It's doing something. You, this is the problem with computers. They're very literal-minded, and they do exactly what you tell them. Unfortunately, 
that means they're going to do exactly what you tell them. And if you make a mistake, every programmer learns this, uh, the computer might do something undesirable. So at some point somewhere, you've got the wires crossed, and this is very easy to do with synchronization. Well, I think I, uh, in the past, think the Google Calendar, so... There you go. The best there start. you go. That's the first place I'd start. So... It, this is the pure situation. You can have multiple Apple accounts, by the way, and this is another way people get in trouble. So you might have one account for iTunes that you use to buy stuff, and you might have a separate account for the Apple Store that you use to buy stuff, and you might have a third account on MobileMe. You might even have a fourth account on iCloud. That's completely possible. So what you want to do is make sure that you know which account you're using uh, for synchronization on your iPhone. So you'll go into the iCloud settings on your iPhone, and you'll look at what account. It'll tell you, you know, oh, it's using uh, Chris and Valencia at me.com or whatever. And make a note of that because that's the account it's synchronizing iCloud to. It's a, it, how rec it's a modern iPhone, yes? Yeah, what, what I can't understand is, yeah, I just got the iPhone. I okay. love it. So I it's iOS 5. So that means it's using iCloud. So what you then want to check is make sure I, you know, you, for instance, go in your iPhone settings and see if you're syncing with Google still. You yeah, might. it doesn't say. It just says, uh, I forget what it says, but on my my wife's account, it says my name, Chris. Well, But on my iPhone, it, it has nothing. It just says iCalendar. So I, I don't. Yeah. Look, you've got to look in these settings, not for iCalendar, but for iCloud. Yeah, okay. And then there's a, a list of switches that say sync calendars, sync bookmarks, sync contacts. And what you've done is you, you've crossed those wires. So she's syncing to your account. This can be very embarrassing. <laughs> and I say this with some personal experience. Uh, iMessages is a feature that Apple added recently, which is cool. I don't know how they got this past AT&T. Uh, but it's a it, it means that you can send text messages from your iPhone both using AT&T's own SMS service, which costs money, or if you're on the Internet, using the Internet, which costs less. And iMessages doesn't care. In fact, it will use it, it will use whatever methods better. It'll use the Internet if it can, and if not, it'll use text messaging. The problem is if you've got if you're signed on on your iPhone to an iMessages account, and you got somebody else, let's say your kids, <laughs> for as a, a hypothetical example, your kids, and they're using your iCloud account because, for instance, you want to share music, uh, which is completely legal. You can have all, you know, all your different iPhones can be on the same uh, iTunes account. But then iMessages sign into that. Well, that means your kids will be getting your text messages. It might be undesirable. Just depends what you're saying about them. So it is, it, and it's kind of a spaghetti. It's kind of, that's what programmers call a uh, uh, programming code that is all wired together like spaghetti. It's um, it's a mess. It's hard to figure out what's what the logic is, what's going on, and uh, and the way these interlocking accounts work on iPhone and uh, iMac and uh, so forth is is actually very potentially very confusing. Might be good to delete on your iPhone, all your accounts, delete on your uh, iCal, on your desktop, all your accounts, and start over. Then you can kind of be sure what you've done. John and Burbank, Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Hey, Leo, how you doing? I'm great. How are you, John? Doing pretty good. So I, when I click on Internet Explorer to open up my uh, Internet, I go right to iGoogle, and it gives me a little preview of my Gmail, my Google Calendar, some stock quotes. It also else. says in big big letters at the top, I Google is going away. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Thank you, Google. Yeah, they killed it. Yeah, so what I was wondering is, is there an alternative? I tried uh, Google Chrome. I downloaded Google Chrome, and I know you can set a little theme, and you can have all your apps there, but I like something you know, that... Google has decided to go away from the portal business. So this is a portal. And for a long time, this is what everybody did. Remember My Yahoo, Microsoft had one, MSN, uh, Google had iGoogle. And the idea was your home page, your first page when you launch your computer, and everything's there in a dashboard. And uh, Google, for some reason, has decided to kill iGoogle. It's not dead yet, but they're going to kill it soon. Fortunately, there are other choices um, in this space 
Is Excite still around? Wait a minute. Come on. Excite, really? Somebody in the chat room is saying, no, it's not. <laughs> it's gone. <laughs> um, there's one called Net Vibes that I like a lot. Same idea. Maybe a little more powerful than I Google. Net Vibes, N E T V I B E S dot com. It lets you create a dashboard. Now, it's interesting because even Net Vibes has started to aim at business. They've started to change, uh, pivot what they do. They still have a basic free service that is very much like iGoogle, but the idea is to encourage you to sign up to the Net Vibes Premium, which looks like it costs $500 a month. So <laughs> that's not probably something you want to subscribe to. Is there? Let me ask the chat room. Is there another choice? Um, an iGoogle like uh, I've I've played with a few of them. Net Vibes is the one I remember. Bing, yeah, Bing has a customizable homepage. Uh, site is not gone. All right, so you can. Uh, I don't know how you would customize Bing dot com, but I guess apparently uh, you can. There is my Yahoo still my dot Yahoo. Dot com. I don't know if Yahoo will kill this or not. It's still a you know a dashboard, a desktop that you can customize. Um, let's. I'm asking the chat room, uh, John, because uh, I think there's quite a few of these uh, still. Um, MSN's still doing it. Uh, Excite.com. Wow. Joe Kraus started that, then decided there were UFOs, went on to something else. Yeah, oh, Excite looks quite a bit like iGoogle. The difference is iGoogle didn't wasn't loaded up with ads, and um, pretty much everything is now. Somebody's got one called Sight Hoover, S I T E H O O V E R dot com. Really? Let me take a look at that. Sight Hoover. I've not heard of that one. Imagine a place in which you store all of your favorite websites. And it sounds like it's kind of a um, bookmark front page. That's the other thing you could do is you could make your own. And I know, John C. Dvorak used to favor this. You know, you can have your homepage not just be a page out there on the Internet. It can be a page on your hard drive. So you can craft with a little HTML skills uh, anything that you could do in iGoogle. You could do locally on your hard drive. It'll load faster, um, pull in stuff from all around. I mean, it seems like there ought to be. Somebody ought to make a software tool that lets you do a custom homepage that you store locally. Let me see if I can find that. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Ah, alternative two. Let's see what they said. Their number one is Net Vibes. But, you know, it looks like Net Vibes has made a pivot. This is a little depressing to me. Of course, it was inevitable, wasn't it? Um, so, Net Vibes, awesome new tab page. My faves. M-Y-F-A-V dot E-S, Symbaloo, My Yahoo, Schmedley. Oh, ProtoPage. That was the one I was trying to remember. I actually loved ProtoPage. Loved that. Let me, let me see if that's still around. problem is there's no money to be made on these. Yeah, this is still here. This is probably the one I'd recommend. Really love ProtoPage. Um, very configurable. I wonder if I still have my proto page account. Nope, wrong password. I wonder what password I used. Proto page, let me try. Nope, not that password either. I've forgotten my password, Proto Page. Send me my password. Oh, it'll pull it from your Google account. That's cool. You know, I hear different stories. On the one hand, Amazon said, yes, there will be an opt-out of some kind on the ads and the new Kindle Fires. Um the ads don't bother me. I have a Kindle ad ad supported Kindle uh, basic and it doesn't bother me. But uh, I can see how people would be upset about that. Why should I mention Opera? Does Opera do that? I don't like Opera, that's why. Because I think it's clunky. 
Com. Use my name, Liam. Awesome new tab page. That's an extension. Oh, this is interesting. So this is... Um, let me open it in Chrome. So this is a Chrome extension that lets you basically recreate iGoogle, huh? Let me add this. Let me let me install this on my Chrome Zone. Yeah, Opera Mobile you want to stay away from, Decker, because uh, they intercept SSL. I'm not real crazy about that. Added to Chrome. So now in order to do that, I... What do I do? What do I do? Hmm, I don't know. Sync error, I don't know. Oh, Opera Mini is not the same as Opera Mobile. Well, he said Opera Mobile. So I don't know which is which. Application specific password for my Google account. Really? I mean, I have to make a new application specific password. I hate that. I'll tell you. What a pain in a butt two step authentication is. I could tell you that right now. And I'm not convinced it's more secure. Do a non thirty two library and hit. Why not? <laughs> that you know nobody's gonna know what that is, but I know what that is. That is the Google homepage from yesterday. <laughs> Am I right, Kyle? Playing it in real time. He's playing it in real time. Is it still there? Still, still there. Still there today. So uh, Star Trek is celebrating its what is it? Forty ninth anniversary of the forty uh, sixth anniversary of the television show Star Trek. So if <laughs> so if you go to Google dot com, you'll get this strange picture, strange image of the Starship Enterprise. Uh, with the uh, crew in the shape of the letters G O O G L and E, and you click on and play with them, because you can you can transport into a, you could you know <laughs> do a planet's surface. There's a guy in a red shirt, but he doesn't get clobbered, which is really too bad. Uh, it's fun, and all the sound effects are on there. They must have made a deal with the uh, Paramount. Yeah, red shirt guy survives. <laughs> it's kind of amazing. So we had a fun time during the break comparing all the different things you could use to replace uh, the um, iGoogle homepage because Google has decided in their infinite wisdom to kill iGoogle. And the best suggestion was a kind of a meta suggestion from somebody in the chat room, a place uh, called or website called Alternative2.net. Love Alternative2. What you do is if you go to alternative2.net, you can enter in the program, and I guess in this case, the web page, that you'd like to uh, you'd like to replace. You want to know what the alternatives to it are. And um, it came up with a whole bunch of choices, uh, including NetVibes, that would be a good alternative to iGoogle. So uh, the first one is NetVibes, but then there's a... Um, a uh, Chrome extension called Awesome New Tab Page. There's my fav.es, Symbaloo, Schmedley. And then there's one that I had forgotten about, I'd used years ago that I really like, and it is still out there called ProtoPage. ProtoPage is, uh, it's at ProtoPage, uh, let me see if it's .com. Yeah, .com, P-R-O-T-O-P-A-G-E.com. And the whole idea of ProtoPage really is a better iGoogle experience. 
So uh, you can um, you can go to protopage.com. It's free. You can create, you know, just like I Google little widgets that give you the news or, you know, what. In fact, look, they've got our uh, Twit network on here, which is nice of them. Thank you, Proto Page. Um, blogs, weather forecasts, all the quotes of the day, all of that stuff. It's really sweet. Your daily Dilbert comic strip. So that's a good choice also, protopage.com. Uh, now, admittedly, iGoogle had the biggest choice because iGoogle was, you know, from Google, and so it had everything. But Protopage has quite a few nice widgets. So I, I would say um, give that a try if you want to replace iGoogle. I really like it, and it's free. And then somebody in the chat room said, oh, Opera, the browser, has a similar thing that you can use locally. Okay, there's a good one, too. That's... That's still free, opera.com, O-P-E-R-A.com. 8888-ASK-LEO, that's the phone number if you've got a question, a comment, a suggestion, or you want to recommend, you know, an alternative to. Let's go to the U.K. via Skype. Ashley is on the line. Hi, Ashley. Hey, um, Leo. Welcome to the show. Where in the U.K. are you? I'm from London, so I've had to put up with all the Paralympic traffic. <laughs> One, wonderful. Well, we're glad that uh, glad that you're uh, with us. Unfortunately, the Olympics didn't end. There's there's another Olympics going on, the Paralympics, which is sad. Is not getting the same attention. But uh, yeah, I'm sure that London has not been a fun place to be this summer. What can I do now, for you? Um, yeah, I've just bought a Nexus Seven, and with my fifteen pounds credit, I bought some movies on there. And I want to know how to play them on my big TV. Ah, wouldn't that be nice? Um, the Nexus Seven is the is the uh, Google uh, tablet, which I which I quite like. In fact, I just got a beautiful uh, little bamboo case. Somebody's made a bamboo case that goes all the way around this, and I just I love it. In fact, I'll find the name of the uh, company that does this. But here's the deal on uh, Google Play Store. This is true on Apple TV too. Sometimes the uh, the stuff you buy on there can only be played back on that device. I'm not sure what the uh, story is with the uh, Nexus 7. Does it support DLNA? That's question number one. Um, off the top, uh, off the top of my head, I don't know if it does. And you have a TV that supports DLNA. I would guess it does. Most Android devices do. Then you could simply play the video on. It's kind of like Apple's AirShare or AirPlay. You play the video back on the Nexus 7 and say, put it on my big screen, and it would play through the TV via DLNA. Another way to do it. Is, and I'm pretty sure this supports MHL HDMI, this uh, USB connector. Um, if you you need to buy a special USB adapter that plugs into this and then turns it into an HDMI port, I would suspect that that would work as well. You can even do that on a Galaxy Nexus phone. So there's a there's a couple of ways. But the question I have is, and I'm and I'm not sure off the top of my head. I'm hoping maybe the chat room does know. Does the Play Store let you do that with content that is? Uh, on your device, or is it, as is sometimes the case, limited to that device? It's true, for instance, when you rent something on Apple TV, that you can't play it anywhere but on your Apple TV. You don't own it on other devices. Well, I know you can play it through YouTube if you buy it off the Google Play Store. Ah, that's that's cool. So you could, if you had a Google TV, for instance, and could play YouTube on your big screen TV, you could do it that way. Um, so yeah, that's a li- that's a licensing issue, and I, I if if that's if the case is it doesn't matter, and I don't see any reason to think it does. Uh, you should be able to play it back. So there is uh, there is support for uh, for the HDMI connect cable that I mentioned. You just need a MediaLink HD cable, and you can plug that into the bottom of it. Um, and uh, DLNA support as well, I believe. Yeah, yeah. So there would be two different ways to do this. Would re- require some additional. Uh, support all right thanks uh, what's that name of the bamboo case you got then ah isn't that nice boy i love this that's a good question i gotta find the uh, letter from the guy who made it <laughs> where, did I, where did i stick that i put it somewhere i'll, I'll find it and i'll uh, i'll report back i don't know if you're watching the uh, video stream that we do but uh, if you are i'm showing it and it's just beautiful great case i'd love to see this guy make bamboo cases for other tablets as well it just fits superbly. It's it just slides right on, um, and uh, I have a feeling it's handmade. It feels like it's uh, somebody somebody put a lot of effort into this to uh, make a beautiful. Yeah, 
I like the dodo case. I actually got a dodo case shipped over. Dodo is good too. Yeah, dodo does something very similar with bamboo, and they've been making cases for iPads and iPhones for a long time. I'm very fond of those. Yeah. Ten Tera, yeah. thank you, Tinker D. You are fast. It's uh, the number ten one zero T E R R A dot com. Uh, they make the bamboo Nexus case. It's sold out. Fifty dollars. It was a Kickstarter project. I didn't know that. Um, beautiful. Yeah. I can I can vouch for the quality and the build of this. It's just gorgeous, eco friendly, handmade. In the it says in the American Southwest. Ten Terra. Tim Morris. Thank you for sending me this case. I love it. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. He's trying to raise money on uh, Kickstarter. Boy, if you're interested, that this I, I will give him a plug. Um, let's see. What do you get? Uh, Eco Felt. If you want the bamboo iPhone case, that's thirty dollars. If you let's see, sold out, sold out. The Nexus Seven case, forty-four dollars. You have to pledge. It's a Kickstarter project. Just look for Ten Terra, the number Ten T E R R A on Kickstarter. This is gorgeous, gorgeous. And I would back this one because he's obviously he's made them. <laughs> it's it's my new favorite case. I wish I had one of these for the new Kindle that's coming. I mean, it's beautiful. And that should wear nicely with the hand oils on that. That should really feel... Huh? Yeah, uh, he's going to make an iPhone one. Let me see. I don't know if he's making an iPhone. Yes, he's going to make... Well, no, Eco Felt. Let's see. Bamboo iPhone 4 4S. Eco Felt Bamboo Nexus 7. Yes, he's going to make one for the iPad. Forty nine dollars, you can get a bamboo iPad three. You know what? I'm gonna pledge for that because I would love that on my iPad three. That is the nicest case I've ever seen. Me and Kickstarter, we got a thing going on. <laughs> but see, he already sent me this, and I like it. I like it. And uh, if he ever does an iPhone, uh, iPhone five case. Mm. Mm. It's beautiful. Really nicely made. Um, slides on and off easily, but it, but it doesn't really feel loose at all. And he's done the ports beautifully, so you don't have to uh, take it off to plug it in. Well, actually, I take that back. I, uh, I have a variety of micro USB cables. Some of them, the plastic uh, is sleeve is too big. Some of them it's not. Let's see. Yeah, that one's fine. Fits right in. So it must be an abnormally large one. I have one of them at home. Yeah, that's charging. And he's, you know, he's done it very nicely. He holds for the speakers and uh, there's the, I guess, the microphone. Maybe another one up here. It's nice. Yeah, the official cable fits. That's right. And this is not an official cable. I don't know what this cable is. Most cables probably fit. Nexus 7 does not rotate to landscape mode when turned. Let's let's see. You got uh, you have a, a must because there's a rotation lock button. <laughs> so I would I would guess that whatever whoever said that is uh, now it won't do it on the desktop. Maybe they mean that. It means the home page won't. But if I'm in let's say twit.tv, let's let's go here and I'm watching the live video of that and if I turn it like this it seems to rotate that seems like it's rotating let's watch that again doesn't do it on the home screen however <laughs> if you launch a program that rotates like our twit program from f-con yes um so it's it's application specific, and I, I I am I losing Nova Launcher? I think I am. I love Nova Launcher. That's like my 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 go to launcher now. This is not. This is actually a native uh, Jelly Bean. Yeah, you ha it just this the the Jelly Bean home screen does not rotate. That's a hard thing to do because it would have to rearrange everything, right? Non non trivial. Exactly. 
Yeah, this is a nice uh, bamboo case. And I see that it is a Kickstarter project. You know about Kickstarter, right? Kind of an interesting uh, website where uh, you don't invest in the company. You just say, hey, I'd like to give you some money. And uh, if uh, if enough money is raised, uh, they'll charge you. And uh, then you'll get a reward. It could be anything from a T-shirt to the actual product. In this case, it's uh, if you go to kickstarter.com and search for the number 10 T-E-R-R-A, 10-T-E-R-R-A, you'll find... Uh, Tim's listing for the uh, eco-friendly cases for iPad, iPhone, and Nexus 7, these bamboo cases. He sent me one. I just got it yesterday. I love it. And he's trying to raise $9,000 to get this business off the ground. So far, only uh, only $796, but there are three weeks left. And for $44, you can get the Nexus 7 bamboo. I just pledged $49 bucks because uh, he's, got, uh, he's also going to do iPad 3 cases. That would be nice. I really like how these look, and I and I can vouch that it exists. You know, I've I've purchased or bid or whatever you call it, contributed on Kickstarter to a number of projects that I've never gotten anything from. So you understand, buyer beware on Kickstarter. But I know I know this product exists because ha- I'm holding it, and I know I like it because it it just is nice. Eighty eight eighty eight to ask Leo. That's the phone number. If you got a question, comment, suggestion, Joe in Houston, Texas. Hey, Joe Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Hey, Leo. It's sure is great to talk to you. Uh, whether calling. you know it or not, you were there for all of my teen years. Oh, Tonight. that's great. Through Tech TV or? Yeah, Tech TV. Just great memories. So. Fantastic. Yeah, well, it's fun because I have great memories of Tech TV too. That was those. That was a great time. I feel like the Captain Kangaroo for geeks. You know. It was really, I mean, it's just an era that I look back on with fondness. Me too. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, no problem. Hey, um, I have a very odd issue with my iPhone. Um, I was on my laptop, my PC, my regular laptop, and I was copying and pasting a link. And when I pasted, just a random words came up and I read it and I, I realized that it was a text from my iPhone. Wow. Yeah, it's very odd, and that was about a year ago, and a couple of months ago it happened again. Uh, you know, I just dismissed so it. So your question time. is, how did that text from my iPhone how? get on my clipboard on my desktop? Exactly. And I think to that PC, but since the two times that it happened, different PCs, different phone, iPhones, because I turned one in for a warranty, so very random, very odd. Well, you got <laughs> me. How would that happen? Yeah. Um, I have no do you have clue. any any software on um, your Mac that picks up text messages from your phone, like uh, iMessages? It's, no, I mean no. I just think through iTunes, and it's not a Mac; it's a PC. Well, then that's so. just so you definitely don't have iMessage on there. Um, no. Very strange. <laughs> you got me. Anybody in the I've chat room got an idea? It's the magic of the cloud. <laughs> yeah, it is. I've checked the forums, and I was just ignored because nobody could figure well, it, it out. Well, no, it makes no sense. So th- there's no, two There's two conundrums or conundrum, yeah. conundry here. <laughs> One is uh, how did the text message uh, get from your phone to the Windows machine in the first place? Yeah, the, well, I think to that machine, so I figure it has the data in there somewhere. But why would it be on the clipboard? Right, that's the second conundrum. How the even if it's even if it's in there somewhere, how did it get on the clipboard? Are you yeah, yeah. using any uh, add-on program on Windows that in any way modifies the clipboard, manipulates the clipboard? Not that I know of. Everything is just straightforward. I I usually don't get extra. I, yeah, I don't. Know, I can't think of how that would happen unless somebody's messing with you, Joe. Yeah. Well, you know, I, I've, I'm a conspiracy. Uh, you know. <laughs> you listen. You listen to a No Agenda show, huh? <laughs> <laughs> sure the FBI was after me. Yeah, that could be. Um, <laughs> you know, I, I think it's probably nothing to worry about. It's just strange. It is very strange. So I thought I'd let you know in case someone else out there had the same issue. Thank you, Joe. And I'll keep my eye on the chat room. And uh, That's weird. So just so you understand it, he's got he's getting a, you get a text on your iPhone, right? Text message. It's on your iPhone. The next thing you know, you paste something on your Windows machine... And and what you get is your text message that was on your iPhone. That's like a that's worthy of David Copperfield. That is a magic trick. That's a pen and teller right there. I have no idea how that could happen. 
Maybe you need to. Uh, <laughs> maybe you need to get an antivirus. I don't know. I just uh, even malware shouldn't be doing that. Copy the clipboard function of an application. Maybe there's remote access. Yeah, you know, it's going to be some strange combination. Stan in Costa Mesa, Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Hi, Stan. Hi, Leo. Hi there. I have a, a question for you about the new Nokia 920 and the 820. Mm -hmm. I have an HTC, uh, as an old dinosaur, an XV6900, which I hate. So I'm looking forward to uh, hearing what you have to say about the 920 and the 820. I don't Nokia like announced, announced these uh, phones at Nokia World. Uh, and we've learned that AT&T will be offering the 920 in, uh, I think, November 1st, I think was the date I saw. Have you heard anything from Verizon? That's a big it? question. Verizon has said they're going to do some Windows phones. Verizon's not been a good place for Windows phone. Um, yeah. But I don't think, I don't know if Nokia has a deal. I think it's AT&T. And that wouldn't surprise me because AT&T sold the Lumion 800 and uh, 810 and, and 900 as well. So here's the deal. I think this is a very... Very nice phone for a few reasons. First of all, it's the new Windows 8 phone. Uh, I think Microsoft's done a very nice job with Windows 8. Great user interface, easy to use, snappy as heck. Um, and Nokia's put some very nice new features into this. For instance, they've got a probably it'll be the best camera phone on the market. Nokia's famous for good camera phones. This has a Zeiss lens, optical image stabilization. It's a little more than 8 megapixels, but it's using uh, something they call Pure View that gives it very good performance in low light. I've never seen a smartphone do such a good job in low light. Four and a half inch display on the, the Lumia 920 and wireless charging. It comes with a pillow <laughs> that you put your phone on and it charges. The wireless charging pillow by Fatboy. So I now, think... How Oh, hold on a second. We'll talk some more right after this. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Actually, it's not just Fat Boy. Other companies. Nokia will sell a wireless charging plate, but I like the pillow or the stand. I actually want one of these. It's a crazy world we live in, and more than any question. I like I this. Asked, Power up wireless charging I speaker. Like you put your Check phone on the speaker. Spyware from malware. Charges the phone. And it's music from JBL. Don't you love that? That is sweet. It has the most advanced heuristic thing. That means it it detects the bad guys. I think this is this is going to be it. And I love the colors. I got to say the colors are beautiful. Um, no cyan, but I would probably get the red. Maybe the yellow. Yellow looks like an emergency color. Um, I've seen images in in almost the dark from this camera that look incredible. Of course, we'll get one and review it, but uh, that's encouraging. I think wireless charging is a must going forward. But you know, summertime is over. Sorry, sorry. Time to get back to the work groove. But you know, it's I'm not a super Windows Phone fan, but uh, I have to say I, I think this is going to be a good phone. It's gorgeous. Look at that. Gives you access to your entire office computer, no matter where you are. I'm going to get the JBL speaker. You just plop the phone on there. Or iPhone with the free Go to My PC app. I'm not crazy about Windows. Uh, Windows for phone. It's not bad. It's great. It's just I wish there were more apps. Um, now that there's Audible on it. I think that that's pretty uh, pretty good. I wonder how much this is, because I'd like to buy this JBL speaker. What do you think, 200 bucks? I like that idea. They're smart to be selling. It's got NFC. Wow. It's got to be 200 bucks, right? Hit the road. Buy that so fast. Fifteen millimeters if you use NFC. Ten meters if you use Bluetooth. Uses near NFC or Bluetooth two one. Wow! And it uses Qi, the wireless charging standard. Sweet. The only thing missing, the price. Two ninety nine for that? No, really. 
I could see 200. 299 is a little. <laughs> yeah, Tony's moved over to Windows Phone. Of course, Alex uses it. It's very much more elegant than uh, iPhone or Android. Um, I think very sweet, but you know, I, I'm, you know, I have to get it anyway to review it. But um, the camera is what really tempts me. They have a 41 megapixel camera, but. <laughs> Oh, oh, no. The price of the JBL power up. Bloomberg says two ninety nine. Really? Wow. Wow. Oh, this is a press release. No. Oh, I guess if you think you're getting a charger and a speaker. Oh no, the JBL play up one forty nine. JBL power up two ninety nine. Wow, that's a lot. Maybe the Qi license is expensive. <laughs> bup, 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 bup. Okay, so I got to do an E set with this next one. Yeah, that would be great, Leo. You Thank got you. it, Bubala. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. 8888 ask Leo, man. That's a, that's a groovy number. Let's uh, finish up with uh, Stan in Costa Mesa, and then we can uh, talk a little bit to our gadget hound, Dick D. Bartolo, the Giz Whiz. So uh, I'm very excited about this. Now, Windows Phone 8 is a new operating system uh, from Microsoft and has some nice new features. It will, I believe, run Windows Phone 7 apps, right? But uh, Windows Phone 7 won't run Windows Phone 8 apps. And Windows Phone 8 apps won't run Windows 8 apps. But, uh, so, you know, there's a... <laughs> but I, well, I'm really not much of an app guy. I'm just more interested in, for Outlook for work between my wife and I on the desktop. When we had gotten that HTC, we could uh, perfect, forward... Uh, perfect reason to get a Windows Phone. Okay, so the, your opinion that you got to play with it and you really liked it. Though. No, I haven't played with it. Uh, I was not at the uh, announce uh, event in New York. Uh, uh, but it, we will probably have one by November. And, Great. Uh, look- yeah, and Verizon says we are in negotiations with Nokia. So it's possible. there'll be a, I would prefer a Verizon version myself. But we shall yeah. see. We shall see. Oh, I'll look forward to you reviewing one. Then. Yeah, Thank I will. You, I want to get it absolutely, Stan, the minute it comes out. Uh <laughs> I will also be getting a new iPhone the minute it comes out. And the Galaxy Note 2. <laughs> I, I, uh, I don't want to do it. I don't, I don't want to do it. I just have to do it. It's my job. That's what Dick D. Bartolo says. He's Mad's maddest writer for more than 40 years, and he's also our gadget reviewer. We call him the Gizwiz. He's on uh, via Skype from Manhattan. Hello, Dickie D. Leo, how you doing, pal? Very, very well. What phone? The man who's who's crying. I have to buy this phone. Hey, it's uh, it's I got you know it's a tough job. Yeah, so, I know. I know. You know, but there is a point at which you go, oh. I think people package. don't understand that. I think people you know think, oh, isn't that cool? You can get every phone that comes out. Yes, but uh, you know, I feel personally, in order to review a phone, I've got to use it for weeks. I can't just say, oh, that's nice, and put it down. I got to try it. Yeah, and, no, uh, it is. I got to kind of throw my heart into it. And I can't just use that one. That, you know, uh, I can't use two phones. I have to use that one phone for several weeks. So it means transferring everything over, et cetera, et cetera. What do you use these days for a phone? Uh, I am using the Galaxy S3 or yeah, 3S. Yeah, too. I love that phone. Yeah. This is, I in really my opinion, do. the best phone out right now. Yeah. Yeah. But that's going to change in about a week. <laughs> well, you'll tell me if I'll let you know. Better. I'll let you you'll know. let me know. You'll say, uh, Dick, you know the S <laughs> three. Forget it. Uh-huh. Nothing. Nothing. Oh, say, yeah, yeah. Well, you'll say, Dick, just hang on to the S three. Yeah. I do like. Uh, we were talking about the Nokia uh, newest Nokia phone that uh, was announced, but it will be out in a month or two. The Lumia nine twenty. It has wireless charging, and I do like that. Where you just plop the phone. Oh one the, yeah. One of the things they're going to sell is a JBL speaker. You pop the phone on the speaker. You can play music through the speaker, but it's charging. 
the same time. No connection. I like That's that. That's nice. Yeah. That's nice. So what do you got for us today? Uh, I have something new uh, for the younger set. Now, uh, a couple months ago on the Gizwiz, you showed the Parrot AR drone, the quadcopter with that. the camera. Oh. Uh, so this is a little more modest, but a lot of fun. Well, a lot cheaper, too, for kids. Um, it's, it's from Spin Master, and it's called Battle Tracker via Air Hogs. So basically, um, it's two remote control toys in one, two in one. Wow! So you get a you get a remote control helicopter, yeah. but the helicopter can actually fire little foam discs. The second part of this kit is ART, <laughs> which stands for the Automated Robotic Turret. So as you fly the helicopter, that automated robotic turret follows it. Wait a minute. You mean you, you've got surface-to-air missiles? That is exactly right. So you have to outrun the, the turret. Now, this sounds is, like fun. Yes, no, which is firing at and you. You're, and it can, you're training it a can, whole generation of uh, future uh, warriors. Air Force people. Air yes, Force, exactly, yeah. exactly, exactly. And it wow. can knock, uh, knock you out of the sky, and it's built to... Uh, crash down and fly again but the other neat thing leo is that that's if you're playing alone you it's you versus uh, versus the automated robotic turret but if you have a friend come over you give him the wired remote control for the turret and then you try to outfly him wow uh yeah so, this sounds like mirth and merriment for all unless you poke somebody's eye out with the missile well, you know, they're little, they're, they're Nerf quality okay. missiles. They're very so lightweight. I, and, yeah, not. and as a matter of fact, I think they said it would even take little Nerf uh, bullets in there. Um, I it looks like it, it has a laser tracker of some kind. You know what? It, it The tracker actually it is infrared. The, the cop that has an infrared light in it that the uh, little uh, automated robotic turret can see and wow. follow. Wow. So just put tape over that when your friends come. <laughs> They'll never catch you. <laughs> Uh, How much is bucks. this? That's not bad uh, for all yeah, of that. Ninety nine, ninety nine, and the... it's just coming out now. And my guess is, when it's fully in the marketplace, you'll probably be able to get something off that. Uh, but Does it's that include Air... both the helicopter but, but, and but, the, yes, and the... exactly wow. it, but both devices. It's called Air Hogs Battle Tracker, and it just went up on their website at airhogs.com. Dick D. Bartolo has the "What the Heck Is It" contest. This is a chance yes. for you to win. A Mad Magazine autographed by Dickie D himself, Mad Magazine's maddest writer. It's on his website, gizwiz.biz. Uh, we finally found out what last month's What the Heck Is It was. Yep, the uh, toilet seat for people with square butts. Okay, that's one Most way of given looking answer. at it. That just shows you the audience <laughs> that we cater to. <laughs> it was actually a baker's band, a no-spill ovenware band that fits over standard baking dishes to prevent your pie from boiling over. Now yes. you've got some sort of weird grommet or I don't know what it is. But tell you what, folks, it, you're, you're more space like space age device, perhaps. You're more likely to win if you get it wrong, frankly. Yeah. So go to gizwiz.biz, click the what the heck is it uh, button, and you have a chance to win an autographed copy of Mad Magazine from this guy right here, Dickie yep. D. Thank you, Loses Dick. are us. <laughs> Take care, Dick. Okay, buddy. All right. Justin and Corona, Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Hi, Justin. Hi, Leo. Thanks for uh, taking my call. Um, I had a couple questions about, or a question about um, the Penguin and Panda update. Um, they, they, I believe they refreshed it about a month and a half ago, and it was just devastating to my rankings. Um, you know, we, we ranked on the first page, um, first position for a ton of keywords. Um, after that update, uh, we dropped the, you know, up the first page, um, second page for a lot of rankings. Uh, we've filled, we followed it to a T, um, or made the corrections that needed to be made as far as the link building and the, the content and, and such. But I was wondering if there is any places you know where to go to get additional information or any advice you have. Um, as it, it brought back some of our rankings, I mean, we're definitely ranking better on Yahoo and Bing now, uh, which we weren't, they weren't giving us any love before they are now. Um, but yeah, I mean, we've lost two thirds of our organic traffic. Oh, that's got to kill you. So Google, it, just to explain, is always updating their search algorithm, and uh, they have uh, a couple of new updates. One was called Penguin, and uh, the second was uh, Panda, 
And these updates do change how Google ranks you. And the idea, from Google's point of view, is to improve their search results, to lower rank sites they believe are spammy. Um, out of time, we'll have to talk about it later. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Well, that's it for the Tech Guy show for today. I'm Leo Laporte. Thank you so much for joining us. Don't forget, the Tech Guy is just the tip of the iceberg. We do nearly 30 shows now on the Twit Netcast Network, and you'll find them all at twit.tv. We talk about Windows and Windows Weekly, Macintosh and Mac Break Weekly, iPad on iPad Today. You get your daily dose of tech news from Tech News Today and our weekly roundtable show This Week in Tech. It's all at twit.tv. And I'll be back next time with another great Tech Guy podcast. Thanks for joining me. See you next time.